Just stand at ease for a moment. We'll get the computer up. We are now live, streaming to the world. House will please come to order. Mr. Majority Floor Leader. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Pursuant to House Rule 7-3, I would like to lay back one day House Bill 173 and House Bill 174. Oh, yeah. Without objection, House Bill 173 and 174 is laid back one day. Let's stand at ease a minute while I find my glasses. Look on my desk. My apologies, colleagues. So the next bill on third reading for consideration is House Bill 188. House Bill 188, sponsored by Representative Hunt, Irrigation District Loans, an act relating to intergovernmental cooperation being enacted by the legislature of the state of Wyoming. House Bill 188, having been read three separate times, the question is, shall the bill pass? Chief Clerk, please call the roll. Andrew, Aye. Baker, Aye. Banks, Aye. Bear, Aye. Blackburn, Aye. Blackburn. Aye. Repeat, please. Aye. Brown, Aye. Burkhart, Aye. Burt, Clawson, Clifford, Aye. Connolly, Aye. Crago, Aye. Duncan. Duncan, Eklund, Ayer, Flitner, excused, Fortner, Gray, Greer, Hallinan, Haroldson, Harshman, Heiner, Henderson, Hunt, Jennings, Kenner, Knapp, Larson Lloyd, Larson Dan, McGuire, Martinez, Nyman, Newsom, Nicholas, Oakley, Obermuller. Repeat, please. Obermuller. Obermuller. O'Hearn, Olson, Ottman. Paxton, Provenza, Roscoe, Aye. Schwartz, Aye. Sherwood, Aye. Simpson, Aye. Summers, Aye. Stith, Aye. Stivar, Aye. Sweeney, Aye. Sweeney, Aye. Walters, Washett, Western, Aye. Wharf, Wharf, I or no, Wharf. Williams. Wilson. Winter. Yin. Zawanitzer. Mr. Speaker. Duncan. Sweeney. Excused. Closing vote. Are there any changes? Gray, I to no, Brown. I to no, Olson. Are we changing our vote? Are we sitting down? Closing vote. The vote is closed. 51 I, seven no, two excused. House Bill 188, having received the affirmative vote of the majority of the members elected to the House, House Bill 188 has passed the House. Next bill for consideration is 193. House Bill 193, sponsored by Representative Crago, 
county attorneys, representation of special districts, an act relating to the county officers being enacted by the legislature of the state of Wyoming. House Bill 193, having been read streets at the times, the question is, shall the bill pass? Chief Clerk, please call the roll. Andrew. Baker. Baker. Banks. Aye. Bear. Aye. Blackburn. Brown. Aye. Burkhart. Burt. No. Clausen. Clifford. Connolly. Crago. Duncan, Eklund, Ayer, Flitner excused, Fortner, Gray, Greer, Hallinan, Haroldson, Harshman, Heiner, Henderson, Hunt, Jennings, Kenner, Knapp, Larson Lloyd, Larson Dan, McGuire, Martinez, Nyman. I. Newsom. Nicholas. Oakley. Obermuller. O'Hearn. Olson. Ottman. Paxton. Provenza, Roscoe, Aye. Schwartz, Aye. Sherwood, Simpson, Aye. Summers, Aye. Stith, Aye. Stivar, Aye. Sweeney, Aye. Walters, Aye. Washit, Aye. Western, no. Wharf, Aye. Williams, Wilson, Winter, Yin, Zawanitzer, Mr. Speaker. Closing vote, are there any changes? Western, no to I, Nyman. Closing vote, Haroldson, I to no. Further changes? Ottman, I to no. Further changes? Closing vote. The vote is closed, 41 aye, 18 no, one excused. House Bill 193, having received the affirmative vote of the majority of the members elected to the House, House Bill 193 has passed the House. So members, I'm just gonna um, just take a, a quick um, moment actually let's do a privilege of the floor chairman olson thank you mr speaker trying to beat the majority floor leader to the mic he's eager to get us moving forward i know that but i have a privilege and uh we have here in these beautiful red coats some students if you all stand up and hold your applause i'm going to read off um, these are our 2022 2021 state officer team from skills usa so I'm going to read them off in their communities where they reside from, and then we'll, we'll uh, welcome them all at once. So we have Caden Jackson, the president, you can raise your hand, from Cheyenne Central High School, senior. Riley Milburn, secretary, Cheyenne Central High School, senior. Isaac Moss, treasurer, Douglas High School, senior. Julia Martins, parliamentarian, Buffalo High School, junior. Devin Crook, reporter, Lyman High School, senior. Josiah Barlett, historian, junior, and Jenny Wilcox, state director. From? Doesn't say. From Wyoming. Wyoming! Well, welcome, skills folks. We appreciate you being here. Hopefully you can learn some skills from this crowd, but you can probably teach us a bunch too. So hope you enjoy your afternoon with us. Thank you. Travel safe. Any other privileges? 
So I'm just going to take a, a brief moment to uh, just for the audit, the, those listening and um, out there, not in the gallery that we 173 and 174 were laid back. Um, that's in accordance with our rules. There's not a limitation by, by, to how many days a bill or how many times a bill can be laid back, but it is one day at a time. So um, with that, we're going to clear up our afternoon, be able to do some committee of the whole, which gets to some of the bills that may be important to members of this body. You'll also note that some of our members had longer ways to travel and some have already departed and some may depart as the day goes on. And that's certainly appropriate just to maintain a quorum and maintain our, our order of business. And we'll, we'll get some good work done this afternoon. With that, Mr. Majority Floor Leader. Mr. Oh, Mr. Mr. One moment before I go further. So there's been a couple of times when we've done done votes and changes of votes. If you're standing on the floor, the chief clerk doesn't know if you're ga stargazing or changing your vote or visiting. So please, when we're doing roll calls, either be seated or standing if you want to change your vote. The second thing is our rules say I and no. And I, there's references in the rules. I can get them for you. It's an I, A-Y-E, or a no when we're calling the roll. So that's why the chief stops because that's what she is supposed to, that's her obligation is to take that I and no. So Chief Clerk is doing her job. Let's uh, be respectful and respond in the appropriate way. Mr. Majority Floor Leader. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Mr. Speaker, I move the House to resolve itself into Committee of the Whole. You've heard the Majority Floor Leader's motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. I was trying to trying to do that uh, Western thing. Well, we have a new uh, chairman today, Representative Sherwood. The House will please come to order. <laughs> Representative Summers, are you for us? Madam Chairman, thank you. And uh, so Madam Chairman, I'm gonna reorder the general file list, just one bill. And so we're, we'll roll down and I'll probably do another bill. There's a couple of members want one bill exchange for another, but I'll wait on that. But to start the list out, instead of starting with House Bill 205, we're gonna start with House Bill 92. House Bill 92, the Revisers Bill. And uh, so, Madam Chairman, thank you. So the first bill for our consideration is House Bill 92. Would the reading clerk read the bill? House Bill 92, sponsored by Management Council, the Revisers Bill, an act relating to the revision of statutes. Mr. Speaker, your committee number 12 Rules, procedures to whom was referred House Bill 92, the revisor's bill. Respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Eyes, Representatives Barlow, Brown, Connolly, Gray, Greer, Jennings, McGuire, Olson, Summers, Washett, Wilson, 
Yin Zwanitzer. Representative Barlow, Chairman. There we go. You have heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure? And I didn't hear it. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Madam Chairman, I move when the Committee of the Whole rises to report and do so with the recommendation that House Bill 92 do pass. And I turn over the explanation of the bill, Madam Chairman, with your, with your uh, acceptance to the Majority Floor Leader. Majority Floor Leader Summers. Madam Chairman, thank you. <clears throat> and so ladies and gentlemen, I bring you uh, House Bill 92 and ask for your favorable consideration. And so what the revisers bill is, is all during the interim, our good staff picks up these little mistakes that, are, that have been made in statute. And so what this does, this is like the technical correction bill of the session. So we, we build up these technical corrections and then staff creates a bill and it's called the revisers bill. And so what I'm gonna do first, Madam, Madam Chairman, is I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move standing committee amendment number one to House Bill 92 and ask for your favorable consideration. Is there any discussion? Question being called. Um, Representative Summers. Thank you. So Madam Chairwoman, thank you. And so ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm gonna start off by kind of a preface on the whole thing. I am not gonna go through this page by page. I have a breakdown from staff if you wanna see what each thing does. So the reason you're seeing a standing committee amendment, so the bill was drafted and then as other bills were drafted prior to session, they picked up even more mistakes. And so that's what the standing committee amendment was. And then actually we had a new bill. So you're gonna see a committee of the whole bill amendment. And actually we had a, we've had even more as bills have been passed, we found other corrections that need to be made. So I would urge your support of the standing committee amendment. Question being called. All those in favor of majority four leaders motion to approve the standing committee amendment, please vote aye. aye. No, opposed? And no? And the standing committee amendment is adopted. Representative Summers. Madam Chairman, thank you. And now I'd like to move Committee of the Whole Amendment number one. And then I will, exp I will explain the amendment. And so this amendment really epitomizes what most of the reviser bill is. We could call it the dollar sign bill. So if you look at the Committee of the Whole Amendment, there's a whole bunch of dollar signs in front of, uh, in front of numbers. And if you look in the revisers bill, in, you know, there's, there's a lot of things in the revisers bill, but there's pages of dollar signs as well. And so, uh, and, and one of them, the reason I found the committee of the whole amendment, I, the, the, good, uh, the good chairman of the woodshed committee to my left here, he uh, passed a little bill that had a dollar figure in it. And I noticed, well, it didn't have a dollar sign. And so that in, ended up what started the committee of the whole amendment. And so, um, so, Madam Chairman, I would, uh, unless there's no questions, I would call for the question on the Committee of the Whole Amendment. Discussion or question of being called? All, all of those in favor of Committee of the Whole Amendment number one, say aye. aye. Opposed? No. And that Committee of the Whole Amendment passes. And we're back to the bill. Just one final comment, Madam Chairman. I have a document from our good staff that explains in more greater detail, um, you know, most of these amendments. If anybody in the body would like it, I'll be glad to provide it. Otherwise, I'd call for question on the bill. Any discussion on the bill? 
question being called? So all those in favor of Chairman Barlow's motion that House Bill 92 pass, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no? Um, the bill passes, first reading. House Bill 92 has passed the Committee of the Whole. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 205 and Representative Greer. Oh, the reading clerk will read the bill. House Bill 205, sponsored by Representative Banks, Select Committee on Extractive Industry Transitions, an act relating to the legislature. Mr. Speaker, your committee number nine, Minerals, Business and Economic Development, to whom is referred House Bill 205, Select Committee on Extractive Industry Transitions, respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representatives Burkhart, Duncan, Ayer, Greer, Sherwood, Western. Noes, Representatives Bear, Gray, Heiner. Representative Duncan, Vice Chairman. This bill was re-referred to committee number two appropriations. Mr. Speaker, your committee number two appropriations to whom was referred House Bill 205, Select Committee on Extractive Industry Transitions, respectfully reports the same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representatives Kenner, Larson Lloyd, Nicholas, Schwartz, Simpson, Stiff, Walters. Representative Nicholas, Chairman. You have heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure? Representative Greer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I move that when the committee, the whole rise is reported, do so the recommendation that House Bill 205 do pass. Madam Chairman, there is a standing committee amendment, but the, um, the sponsor of the bill will work that into his explanation and then I'll move it towards the end. So with that, I'd like to turn the explanation over to the distinguished gentleman from House District 17. Yes, Representative Banks. Chairwoman Sherwood. Um, so the nexus for this bill came about several years ago in my community. One of the coal-fired power plants to the east of our community announced its phased-in closure over the next decade or so. Um, it's been a long-term major employer in our community and major contributor to the economy. And so uh, that was sort of the nexus for this bill, where that would come about. And so this bill is a forward-thinking bill that'll allow us to best serve our communities and workers impacted by the fluctuation in extractive industries and potential closures of coal-fired power plants and coal mines. The bill creates a select committee, well, and we're gonna sort of talk a little bit about that in the amendment on extractive industry transitions with members from the House and the Senate in coordination with the Wyoming Business Council and the WEA, the um, Wyoming Energy Authority. The, they will then develop a plan to identify and support ways to add value and facilitate economic development in our natural resource sector, including through the development and introduction of potential legislation. The bill allows the legislature to continue supporting our communities and workers while identifying ways to help diversify the economy and provide quality jobs for those impacted. So you'll notice um, there is the standing committee amendment um, which sort of changes a little bit of just the makeup of how this committee works. So rather than a select committee, it becomes a, a subcommittee of the minerals committee, the mineral standing committee. Um, but essentially it takes, allows for three members appointed by the president, or sorry, two members appointed by the president of the Senate from that committee, and then three members appointed by the speaker of the house onto that committee. So then that standing or that uh, subcommittee becomes a five member committee. Uh, the idea really is that they will visit those communities, work with stakeholders in those in all of our communities and look for ideas of how we can further enhance um, coal production, how we can help those communities that are facing potential closures, mine closures, power plant closures, and what we can do to further help keep those communities striving and keep those communities growing. Um, without, with that, I would move the standing committee amendment and the bill. You have heard the motion on the standing committee amendment. Are you ready for the question? Discussion. Representative Washett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question on the, on the as near as equally divided language. 
when you only have two positions, it's really, really hard to balance that in, in a meaningful way. Can you, can you articulate why you put in as near as equal as possible? Representative Banks, or Representative Greer. Thank you, Madam um, Chairman. I'll, I'll answer that seeing as how it was our committee's amendment that did that. Um, we were, we were a bit remiss for another select committee, uh, but this is a good idea as part of, as we, as we um, dive into the business council, this interim is our intention with the minerals committee. And what uh, we have a tendency to do uh, is my, my co-chair from the other house is we appoint subcommittees to do work on things. And this was an opportunity where they were going to be spending quite a bit of time to allow them to be compensated most of our committee does all of their subcommittee work for free. And, and while they're glad to do that to be engaged, it does become a burden. And when we're looking at going out into the communities, uh, it is a good thing that they're compensated. The, to answer your specific question is we typically just do that with a two, three split because of the fewer members of the other body that are on. There's only five of them uh, in total on their, on their committee. So that, that's why we did that. Um, this will go to, if they want, if they want to put one more on there, it sure doesn't mean anything to me. I was just kind of following our past, past practice of doing it that way. Is there further discussion on the amendment? Hearing none. Question having been called. We are on uh, amendment number one to House Bill 205. Those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. <laughs> so the standing committee amendment is adopted and we are back on the bill. Question being called. Are we ready to vote here? Yes. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Hello. The bill passes. House Bill 205 has passed, passed committee the whole. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 249. The reading clerk will read the bill. House Bill 249, sponsored by Representative Clifford, Railroad Safety, an act relating to railroads. Mr. Speaker, your committee number 10, Labor, Health, and Social Services, to whom was referred House Bill 249, Railroad Safety, respectfully reports same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. Eyes, Representatives Clifford, Connolly, Romero Martinez, Orff, Wilson. Nose, Representatives Flitner, Hallinan, Ottman. Conflict, Representative Stivar. Representative Wilson, Chairman. You've heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure? Chairman Wilson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I move that when the House when, I'm sorry, when I move that when the committee of the whole rises to report, it do so with the recommendation that House Bill 249 do pass. There are no standing committee amendments, and I will turn the explanation of the bill over to the representative from House District 33. Representative Connolly, or excuse me, <laughs> Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the 66. I bring to you House Bill 249 and would ask for your favorable consideration. Uh, this bill is about safety, the safety of many Wyomingites who work in the cab of a locomotive. It's also about the safety of yours, mine, our communities, and our state. Similar legislation like the bill before has passed in nine states. Uh, the bill creates a new section, 37-9-506, railroad train crews, starting on line 13 through to line 15 and continuing on to page two, lines one through three, subsection A says that no train shall operate in this state without at least two individuals. This is crucial because the jobs entail working with hazardous materials every day. They may transport spent nuclear fuel one day or radioactive materials another, or rockets and bombs on mili military trains another day. On page two, line five, subsection B, this bill imposes a misdemeanor and fine for any railroad company, corporation, or employer who willfully violates subsection A. And you'll see those fines um, there through the text. On line 22, 
This section should not apply to any employer who allows any person as stated on page three, lines two through six to move locomotives unattached to rail cars within a rail yard or to operate a helper service that tempor temporarily assists a train that requires more power. If this legislation should pass, the effective date would be July 1, 2021, and I'll stand for any questions. Representative Newsom. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm on and in support of this bill. I come from a railroad family. My dad and my brother both have retired from um, a railroad company and um, they have informed me of how important a two-man crew is. And it's not important every day. It's kind of like when you get in a car wreck. If you're driving down the road on your own, all is well right up until it's not. And that's the way it goes with trains. Everything goes good right up until it doesn't. And at the point it doesn't, it's very important that there are two people there to mitigate whatever the damage is. And you know, if, if one person is injured or if one person is, God forbid, killed, then what happens with the train? So although there are certainly um, computers that take care of some of the things that go on in train, trains these days, when my dad started, there were six people on a train, and now there are two, sometimes three, but one is just too few. Thank you. Representative Henderson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I rise uh, uh, on and against this bill. Uh, it doesn't have, it's not about safety. Uh, I spent a few years working as the Northern Region Quality Manager for a major railroad in the state to the uh, east of us. And uh, we had the largest train yard in the, in the world and the largest service track. And uh, so I think this is more about uh, collective bargaining as the previous speaker mentioned, you know, uh, years ago, there used to be a lot more people involved and technology has changed. And uh, safety is job one, it's very important. But when you're on an airplane, as an example, uh, there's only two people in the cockpit, and if one of them is gone, you're down to one, plus the system that's on board. And so, you know, we cannot predict an act of God, but uh, I would just suggest that we take a good close look at this and, uh, and resist. It's almost like Groundhog Day. I mean, we did this a, a year or so ago, but uh, I just reiterate the crew size is not is not the issue of safety. There's a lot more involved in that. The, the quality of the, of the uh, locomotive, the maintenance of the system, the brake shoes, the circumstances that the locomotive is transiting through is no different than those folks who were convoyed down here from the, the city of the Friendly Ghost. There's a lot of things that had to come together for that to come off right. And it's certainly the exigencies of the situation that would be called into into consideration, you know, uh, when you come up to a railroad crossing, we don't have it manned, right? There's procedures. We have agencies that are put in place and manage these things as far as safety. And we have, a, we also have a, we also have a very uh, uh, capable uh, safety board and, and, and a place where they go to talk about these labor issues. I, I don't think we want government in the business of interfering in, in collective bargaining issues. So on and against. Representative Duncan. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Madam Chair. On and in favor of this bill. There's a lot involved. These people, men and women who are in the cab, they work, they work 24 seven, 365. I know this because my husband, my spouse, is over 26 years as a conductor and as an engineer. There are many times, in fact, this weekend over the, the storm, he worked, slept less than six hours because then he gets called. Because you are allowed eight hours, but you are able to be called within those six hours to be prepared to work in eight hours. 
So then you work another 12 hours, you sleep, but you're wound up. You can't go to sleep. You finally get to sleep. <clears throat> so maybe it's about four hours. You finally get to sleep. You're called, maybe two in the morning, maybe midnight. And you work another 12 hours. Then you're called and you go right back out. Fatigue. It's not like shift work. It's completely different type of work. God forbid that the person that you're riding in that cab with has a heart attack, gets sick, has something happen. And if you are a single person, single cab, what are you going to do? Now let's add in the weight, the massive size of these engines. They used to be 8,000 feet long. That's a regular train. They're no longer that anymore. They are 15,000 feet long. 15,000 feet long, barreling through your town. Now that might be fine if it's a coal train because that's not really all that toxic. But keep in mind, if it's a toxic train running through Laramie, running through Torrington on these main lines, carrying hazardous materials, running through a crossing, you're talking about crossings that, oh, well they have these Co uh, companies that man these. Well, these companies have cut back. People aren't on the job. They've also cut back the manpower in the yards. So when my husband, and they have a train break in two, there are no brake pads. It's called air. And those hoses come apart. My husband has to wait four hours for a crew to come 100 miles sometimes, 50 miles, before it gets there. Keep in mind, if he's there by himself on the crew, there's not another person. They run through a crossing. What if a person, now there's no, those are unmanned crossings. They're just siren, the, just the alarms now. A person tries to run that crossing to try and avoid the train because they don't want to wait for that 15,000 foot long train because they're in a hurry. There is no way because federally that one man who's on the crew now has to wait with that train. He cannot get off the train to go be an EMT, to go assess the situation in case there's an accident. He has to federally stay with that train. What if there is two men and the other guy has had a heart attack or he's sick, injured? What does he do? He still has to stay. What if there's a fire? What if it's a situation? That other crew man, man sits there and he sometimes, they're out in the middle of nowhere. He's the only person or she is the only person that can relay what milepost they're at, where they're located out in the middle of nowhere. This is not a collective bargaining situation. And if you knew anything new about what's going on, you don't have a choice. It's not a collective bargaining situation. And if you have a train running through your town and your community, are you okay with these 70 mile an hour trains, 15,000 feet long by one man or woman in the middle of the night with no sleep coming through on and for the bill? Representative Fortner. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Uh, normally I'm in the, in the seat with the railroad for saving money, but not when it comes to safety. You can't put a price on safety. Uh, you can't have technology. I don't believe there's technology to do what a human being can do uh, in time of error and emergency. Therefore, I'm for this bill. Thank you. Is there further? Yes. Representative Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, I worked for the railroad as a brakeman for a few years. My family's been working on the railroad since the 20s. When I worked on the railroad, it was a four-man crew and it had a caboose. And I remember when I went to work down there, I told my grandpa, they don't need the caboose and they don't need those brakemen on the rear. My grandpa laughed. He said, oh, they'll always have to happen. Well, there's only two people on the engine now. There's not four. But I dread the day that we would go down to just one person for the safety. And I'm not talking about necessarily the safety of the person on that engine. I'm talking about that person safety that's trying to get across a crossing because her husband had a heart attack, but can't get across the crossing because the train stopped or broke apart. And there was nobody there to, to, to pull the train apart at the crossing to let that person through. Yeah, so I'm for this bill, thanks. Chairman Greer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So the resident opposition of the bill, like I have the last three times it's come before us and for the very same reasons. Um, you know, I too, my dad worked for the railroad. He was, he was a maintenance worker, so he was out on the tracks working. It's true, crew sizes dropped all the way from six, to four. Also now, they don't need a switch man. They don't need a brake man. All that's done automatically. It's done safety, safely. Last year, it was the Federal Railroad Administration issued a report and concluded that crew sizes, that lower crew sizes do not affect safety. They spelled it all out. It's all through that. And I, I didn't realize this bill was up. I would have emailed the report to everybody. Okay. We look at technology. And so, you know, what they talk about positive train control, PTC. Okay, that's the technology where you go through a crossing and the train's not doing what it does, it shuts the train down. It's there, it's a fail safe. No matter what happens, this technology is being safer and we get safer and we get better with it. We're looking at as a body of uh, what do we do with autonomous vehicles, okay? So we, so we have to look at our policy decisions. We, we have not passed this in the past because, and I, and I don't wanna get in the mud and roll around, but because it's been an issue regarding negotiations. Nobody's gonna let an 18,000 ton train go barreling to their community if they don't think it's safe. I'm not. Nobody is. Do I respect those people that work those long hours and, and do those jobs? Yes, I do, because I saw my dad do it. Respect them completely. Do they deserve our respect? Yes, they do. Look at the policy before us. Let's look forward. And let's not, uh, let's not get confused about what we're doing. Vote no on the bill. Representative Yen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, <laughs> Madam Chairman. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I heard the, the talk about autonomous vehicles, and I think there's a difference between a single occupancy vehicle versus a several mile long train. And what I, what I wanted to compare it to would be air travel. And so maybe someone who knows the answer to this, um, when you have an, a, a large jumbo jet, it's got several hundred people in it. I, I'm pretty sure there's a rule that we can't have just one pilot, even though in air travel, autopilot does most of it. Um, so then, then my question may be to, to anyone who knows, do we let jumbo jets fly with only one person? Um, if so, I would, I would love to know that. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Representative Connolly. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm in favor of this bill. And I'd just like to talk a little bit about some of the evidence that we received in committee. 
And it talked about PTC, that, that position, that computerized system and the report regarding safety and about collective bargaining. And the railroads who spoke, there were two different railroads who spoke, honestly told us that they're working on it, right? That they're working on it, that this is not solved, this is not done. So that this is absolutely an issue that is appropriate for our statutes because it is not the case where they automatically have two people on a train. They're talking about the potential, potential for PTC to solve the problems. But does it right now? Not at all. So what we need is to assure that safety, to assure that safety and to know that we have in our statutes all sorts of safety parameters. And those safety parameters then just become the minimum of collective bargaining. So on and in favor, this is the right thing to do, coming not only for the safety of the individuals who are on that train, and what they need to do with a three mile train that breaks down with toxic material on it, but also for our communities. Thank you. Representative Romero Martinez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm on and in favor of this bill. <clears throat> My experience I was born and then since a baby, I grew up in the railroad section between here and Laramie that starts with an H that is now a ghost town. My dad was a railroad labor worker for 33 years. And similar to the other folks who have experience, who have experience on the railroad, I lived on a section. So like the sound of a, of, a, of a train was just as common as an alarm clock. And so the stories of the railroad are my, part of my life. And so I too saw that. I saw, from, I saw the caboose to the everything. And uh, the, the issue of safety here is you're, you're moving megatons down a track one way, and there's only one way to stop that uh, through an emergency brake system. And so I did see the chart that showed that they improved safety, but does anybody remember what just happened a couple of years ago, just right here, just west of Cheyenne? What happened there? Brake system went faulty after the investigation. They didn't answer that in the testimony, but I remember it. And uh, Two men died, one of them, the husband of my cousin. I won't mention names, but even a former Navy shipman testified in committee and he also was in favor of this bill. I remember listening to this bill in the Senate probably 20 years ago and it had passed, I, that's my understanding. It was mentioned in the committee, and the reason why I supported it then and I support it now. In 1991, uh, they said that Congress can step in to help settle negotiations in a collective bargaining. The problem is, without mentioning the railroads, but we already know there's only a few railroads that roll through this state. I know from all of the railroad workers that they have felt that there has been a breakdown in the ability to have those negotiations. We have partners in our state. This is big historic. Obviously, the golden spike. Everybody loves the story. But we need to take care of the families and especially the workers who are either driving these trains or even the people that are working them. I don't want to get too far off the topic. I just think that when we had sections, you had communities. We don't have that anymore. 
So that's why they have to farm a work crew for 50 to 100 miles. I close by saying on and in favor of this bill. It cares for people's lives. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Henderson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Answer to the question about jumbo jets, the answer is yes. You know, our, our airport over here is, uh, is used for many things. And we have that big company that starts with the word that rhymes with bow and ends with the letter G over there on the West Coast. And they bring airplanes in here all the time to test out the new technology and, and validate protocols related to a landing and takeoff of these huge jets. The biggest one in the world was here last summer landing because you know why? Because we have wind, we have elements here that, that they wanna try these things out. Uh, regarding the, uh, the long trains we have for years used uh, something called distributive power, which is basically a, a wireless system on a, on, a, on a train that helps the, the long coal trains. They are long and they do weigh a lot and they do go pretty fast, but they have limits. There's a system on board to monitor how fast that locomotive is going in the train is, is traveling. And if it hits a certain point, well, there's things that are supposed to happen. And that's what the maintenance is all about. You know, I work down here at the depot in both sheet metal work, pipe fitting and machinist. And I was also a hostler. Earlier speaker talked about the, the constraints of a work on the railroad regarding hours of service and limitations and, you know, the stress of the job. My grandfather worked for the railroad for 35 years. I mean, we used to have trains come in over here when the roundhouse was a roundhouse and they'd hit a, they hit a cow or something that happened to accidentally stray out onto the tracks. That was a heck of a mess to clean up, you know, and, and I worked at a service track down here and we had, we had trains coming over here from Laramie that, that operated in the yard. We don't have two man crews on the locomotives when we're moving around the yard. We have one. And by the way, we have remote systems now, as mentioned earlier. You know, we have people who are in the, in the state where the lost wages, the city of lost wages is at that Air Force, I mean, the, the aviation uh, base there. And uh, they operate uh, unmanned, really fast moving uh, planes, is what they call it, you know, that, uh, that have a pretty, pretty smart weapon systems on them and go halfway around the world. So technology is really, really incru increased increased or improved. Um, over here on the summit, we had an accident, unfortunately, a couple of years ago where we had a couple of people there that were uh, involved in a big, a big uh, wreck. Wrecks will happen whether people are on board or not. But uh, like was mentioned, I, I, I think that this is, uh, this is more about a collective bargaining. You know, it used to be you'd have a, a, a caboose on a train. We don't have a caboose anymore. Just have more people. A lot of things have changed over the years. And I think we should have the railroad uh, take care of its private sector business with the agencies that are in government. I'd urge a, a no vote. Thank you. Representative Burt. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I think I got a couple of questions. Um, I'm kind of divided on this one. Uh, I directly work for the railroad. Um, in my job, I actually travel on the same tracks that trains do. In order to do that, we have to have a system to when I apply for the authority to run down the tracks, it puts a system in the computer that the trains are not allowed to occupy the same track that I do. And that's, it's kind of a, a cross measure. It's run by satellites and computers now. Technology has changed. So I get where, where the idea is, as the technology gets better, we can reduce the crews. A couple other things to think about in our particular area is our high wind count that we have in our state. When the, when the wind hits a certain speed, we actually shut our trains down so we don't actually blow them off the tracks. It's hard to believe that we could, but we do have particular trains that, are, that, have, a, that have a high uh, car, car threshold and come into a particular curve at a certain speed. If the wind's high enough, it would actually blow that train over, so they shut them down. Uh, working with uh, or talk, you know, going back to some of the other comments about having a single crew, 
if we shut the trains down and say they're shut down for two, three hours, and there's no contact with anybody because it's a single crew member out there, what if there is that heart attack? How do we find out? How do we get help to that individual? On the other side of it, I don't think the, the state can also dictate what a private company can do. I think that does part of collective bargaining. One of the other things I'm thinking about is our trains leave from state to state, do they follow an interstate, the interstate commerce clause put out by the federal authority? Um, if, in, if nobody's ever trespassed on, on railroad property, I, I'd suggest not to because you won't go to the regular court system, you go to the federal court system. So the, the railroad property itself is federally mandated and regulated. So if we're going to mandate a single crew in the state of Wyoming, what happens when it gets to the border of a neighboring state that does not have the same law? Do we have to stop that train at the border on each side to either put a crew member on, a crew member off? A um, Couple of different questions. I'm, I, I can see the merits on both sides, but I, I'm extreme, I'm really on the fence on either way. There's a lot of questions out there that I don't think just passing the, the, the bill here in, the, in Wyoming addresses everything. When, when you look at the railroad industry as a whole, it is, it is regulated by, by interstate commerce just because of the very nature of what it does. So how does passing a state law affect it at the federal level? And what kind of challenges would we put on with neighboring states and, and, and all that kind of stuff? So I think there's a lot more questions we need to answer before I can get on board. Thank you. Question being called. All those in favor of Representative Wilson's motion that House Bill 249 um, do pass, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no? No. The chair is in doubt. All those in favor, please rise. Thirty yes. So those those opposed, please stand. Nineteen opposed. House Bill 249 has passed the Committee of the Whole. Yes, Representative Wilson, privilege of the floor. Thank you, Madam. Um, members, just a little reminder, and I, I can't use a prop, but you might visualize your yellow sheet of general file bills. We have today, we have Monday. If you look at the bill, the list there, I'm just bringing out from the past that old line about the screaming sound you hear is Bill's dying, so be aware. The next bill for our consideration is House Joint Resolution Number 9. Uh, reading clerk will read the bill. House Joint Resolution 9, sponsored by Representative Sweeney. Local Government Investment and Equities, a joint resolution proposing to amend the Wyoming Constitution to allow local government entities to invest in stocks and equities subjective, subject to legislative authorization. Mr. Speaker, your committee number three revenue to whom was referred House Joint 9, Local Government Investment and Equities, respectfully reports same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Eyes, Representatives Hallinan, Harshman, Henderson, Roscoe, Sweeney, Yin. Noes, Representatives Baker, Gray, Jennings. Representative Harshman, Chairman. You have heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure? Representative Sweeney. Harshman's not, so. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, 
I move that. Right. Okay. Representative Henderson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I move that when the Committee of the Whole rises to report it, do so with the recommendation that House Bill HJ0009 do pass. And I turn the explanation of the bill over to my good friend at the front speaker, or uh, not microphone, thank you. Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, we do have a um, standing, uh, standing committee amendment uh, that we can move it at the appropriate time. Um, I, I can do that, okay. Uh, committee uh, and, and body, this is um, a constitutional amendment and so I'll beg your indulgence for a few minutes, give a brief explanation. The amendment um, uh, further clarifies this, but if you remember a few years back, um, the chief, now our chief executive was our, our state treasurer. And he brought forth, um, I think it was considered Amendment A at that time, so that the permanent mineral trust funds could be um, put more invested into equities, a portion uh, for a better rate of return uh, to the state and monies that we are now um, appropriating and spending. So the problem has now occurred where some of our communities and our counties have um, monies that the city I hail from uh, actually has some perpetual funds that they don't tend to ever spend the corpus, just like the permanent mineral trust funds, and take those earnings and the interest earnings off of that uh, to put back into projects that have been basically paid for um, the Casper Event Center, now the Ford Event Center, uh, as an example, to maintain that facility. So that's one example. Another example might be the county that you hail from. May the commissioners may have funds that they long term would like invested. Well, the problem is with our current structure and the, the way the statutes and the constitution are framed, they only can invest in certain pools in the state uh, under, under the state treasurer and as it applies. So the best they can do uh, typically in this last, uh, just this last fiscal period, was approximately 1.7% return. And so we're, we're stymieing uh, the ability of our municipalities if they have the monies to put uh, into these. So what, what this resolution does is frames that and keep in mind that this first has to uh, pass on third reading by two thirds of this body, then goes to the Senate, has to pass by two thirds of that body. Then if that all happens, then it goes on the ballot to, well, 2022 at the general election to the vote of the people to decide. And then the way this is written, just like Amendment A was, um, and that I'll go to the amendment. Um, 
and ask as for your uh representative henderson would you like to move the amendment thank you madam chairman i move standing committee amendment number one to hj0009 as for your favorable consideration my, my friend will continue to the explanation representative sweeney thank thank you madam chairman so to further on the amendment, what the amendment does, and honestly, this was brought, brought to me uh, by the chief executive asking our consideration, this mirrors what, what took place with Amendment A, um, giving the legislative branch uh, the ability, once this would be in place, the legislature then sets the rules on the, on the investment policy. So it's taking nothing away from us once the voters actually approve this. Um, so with that, I would ask uh, for your favorable consideration on, on the amendment. You have heard the motion on the standing committee amendment. Question have been called. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The amendment passes. Thank you. Been adopted and we're back on the joint resolution. Thank you. So um, in, a, in a nutshell, that's what the bill does. That's, that's the purpose of the joint resolution. And um, I would, uh, ask you uh, for any questions. Rep I'm not sure who was there first. Representative Schwartz. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I just have a question. I'm, I'm reading this on page two, line 16, where the legislature may provide by law. And I want to be clear what it is the legislature is providing by law. Are we assuming that each individual subdivision, town, county, schools will have their own investment group to invest the funds? Or are we gonna provide by law that they are able to work through the state treasurer's office? Representative Gray. Yep. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, so I, in answer to that question, you know, what seemed to indicate, you know, I let the bringer speak for the bill, but what we talked about was the state would be uh, managing it pursuant to law. I think we could probably make that an amendment to make that clear in the joint resolution. That notwithstanding, I, I come up here, I don't want to belabor this, but I speak against this bill. I think it, it incentivizes communities to sell off assets and then to, uh, use those proceeds to invest and you and they can always use the legislature as a backstop in case that fails and i just i i don't like you know it's kind of this is being written for one situation in the county i'm from and um i just don't like where this is going so i urge a no vote thank you representative sweeney thank you madam chairman so on the on the first point the total ability of, of the investment, that's what I know the counties want is to come back and utilize the state treasurer's office. And that's up to this body after this amendment is passed uh, by the vote of the people. And that's exactly what they want. They do not wanna go rogue they are there to protect the taxpayers' money also and invest it wisely. To the second comment, um, this is not a backstop and it does not incentivize counties or municipalities to sell assets. Now, Toronto County had a unique opportunity. The county commissioners decided it was in the best interest of our county uh, to go ahead and sell the asset. 
Now they're hamstrung. They do not want to touch the corpus. That's not what they want. They want to get the best return on their investment and utilize those monies as this body potentially could cut uh, funding to the counties. And they want to utilize that to help not only in operations, but potentially social services. So um, I see this as a tremendous vehicle. It's a heavy lift. And I ask uh, if there's no other questions, your consideration. Representative Washett, did you want to speak? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question for the bringer, if I could. Is our community unique in this situation of having these funds, or are there multiple communities? And if so, do you know how many have these types of reserves that they'd like to be able to invest? Um, Madam Chairman, if I could answer that. Representative Sweeney. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. So no, our community is not unique. I do not know um, exactly, but my belief is um, that potentially Campbell County, Converse County, um, I do not know how many municipalities are out there that would want to lock up funds for a long period of time. Representative Burt. Chairman's want it, sir. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Just to further answer that question on behalf of another county, um, it was actually astounding in my county this year that we had an increase in sales tax revenue. As you all know, we did not have the largest outdoor rodeo in the world held. And so many constituents in Cheyenne thought, oh my gosh, our revenues be way down. But what happened was we had a huge kind of one-time windfall um, from wind energy projects. And because of that, it, it balanced out um, the coffers for our average. But if that had not happened in any other year, we would have had a huge surplus in money. And I'm not sure exactly what our city would have done with it, but I would certainly hope they would have invested it um, similar to uh, you know, a one-time windfall that happened in the Trona County. These don't come along often, but when they do, we, wanna, I, we would like our local government to be the best stewards of resources possible and not rush to the bank to spend them if they can invest them and make a significant amount of interest that's what we're talking here. So why I would strongly support the bill and just a, an example from another county that it does benefit. Representative O'Hearn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, even smaller communities have some funds put aside. So I can speak in another Toronto County that the town of Mills would like to have this option also. And as the bringer mentioned, it's gotta go through two thirds of this house, two thirds of the people down the hall, and it will go to the vote of the people. So that makes a lot of sense. On and four, thank you. Representative Burt, or go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, on, on, the, on the language of page two, line 16, actually we'll go down to line 19. It says that we can, we can basically invest political, you know, basically we can, we can invest funds in, in capital stock of any associational corporation. What is the, the checks and balances to where uh, the, the entities that are, that are investing this money don't get to pick and choose which associations or corporations the money gets invested? How do we know that it's not gonna get abused and a particular corporation is going to get more investment versus another one? And, and how do we just know that we're, it, the government entities that are gonna invest this money aren't picking winners and losers by who's ever investing could be involved in that particular company or the association. Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So again, this is model, this language basically comes off of the, the same language that was used for Amendment A, where the permanent mineral trust funds are currently part of that is being invested in. So it's really not about, in my mind, uh, it's best investment practices 
through the state treasurer's office um, and is is the whole intent here um, and not not picking winners and losers. So Representative Clausen. Thank you, Madam Chairman. On for the bill. So uh, so this bill could, it could be a, a very useful tool for uh, my county as we have huge peaks and valleys, 40, 50, 60 percent peaks and valleys in sales tax. And this would be a great tool to study some of that out and uh, make good use of those funds. Question being called. All those in favor of House Joint Resolution 9. Sorry. Question being called. All those in favor of Representative Henderson's motion that when the Committee of the Whole rises to report, it does so with the recommendation that House, Gener House Joint Resolution 9 do pass. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Do we need a no. So House Joint Resolution 9 um, is adopted. That's <laughs> passed committee of the whole. The next bill for our consideration is House Joint Resolution 11. The reading clerk will read the bill. House Joint Resolution 11, sponsored by Representative Summers. State sovereignty impacted by federal actions. A joint resolution requesting the federal government to respect state sovereignty. Mr. Speaker. Your committee number six, Travel, Recreation, Wildlife, and Cultural Resources, to whom was referred House Joint 11, State Sovereignty Impacted by Federal Actions, respectfully report same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representatives Banks, Flitner, Haroldson, Hunt, Jennings, Knapp, Newsom, Sweeney, Winter. Representative Flitner, Chairman. You have heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure? Representative Newsom. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I move that when the House, when the Committee of the Whole rises to report it, do so with the rec recommendation that House Joint Resolution do pass. And I'll leave the explanation to the good um, House Majority Floor Leader. Representative Summers. Madam Chairwoman, thank you. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I bring you House Joint Resolution 11 and ask for your favorable consideration. And so, as I've received emails from my constituency and, and moving through, I, I guess the termul you know, the tumultuous times we've been in and, and where we're headed, the more and more concern I hear about is concern about overreach of the federal government. And uh, there's not a lot we can do in, in state law, but we can certainly send a message um, back to those good folks in Washington that you know, we have certain rights too as states and people and sovereignty of states and, and that these lands and federal lands are important to us and, and that we believe that our gun rights are important. And so with that, I, I drafted House Joint Resolution 11 and really I'm, I'm not, you guys have probably read it. So I'm just gonna take you through a quick review of it. I'm not gonna read every whereas, but it's really a joint resolution requesting the federal government to respect state sovereignty. And it says, whereas a union of sovereign states established a federal government and delegated limited powers upon that government, whereas any question as to whether powers not delegated to the federal government were retained by the states was answered with the ratification of the 10th Amendment. And then you go on page two, and, and whereas the second amendment to the federal constitution recognizes the right of people to bear arms and that right shall not be infringed. And on down on page two, whereas Wyoming has been blessed with abundant natural resources, which have been developed to create economic prosperity and provide energy independence from foreign nations, thereby providing for the peace, safety, and happiness of all citizens of the United States. And then it kind of continues on, whereas the federal government has recently taken actions limiting the development of natural resources. And then really, I'll just go, I'll go to the end now. I'll do maybe one more. Um, Maybe one more, whereas on page four, whereas a more perfect union will not be realized by actions of any single department of the federal government, cannot be forged by acts of a federal government which exceed delegated powers and should not be tolerated when exercise of those delegated powers harm the welfare of the citizens of states. And then it goes on, whereas all power is inherent in the people and all free governments are founded on their authority. And then now therefore be it resolved 
And section one, basically the current administration of the federal governments and Congress should respect the sovereignty of Wyoming and other states of our union. Section two, the federal government not regulate arms at a national level. Section three on the next page, page five, uh, the current administ administration should respect the critical role that federal lands play in Wyoming's culture, recreation, wildlife, livestock production, mineral development, and tourism. And the current administration and Congress work with the state of Wyoming to develop federal policies in a manner which recognizes their impacts on Wyoming citizens and implements those policies in a manner consistent with the state's culture. And then section four is where you'd send the resolution. So this is just my attempt for us as a legislature to be able to say, you know, Wyoming, we're still here. We have certain rights and we have certain philosophies and, and uh, please respect those. So thank you. Question being called, all those in favor of Representative Newsom's motion that when Committee of the Whole rises to report, it do so with the recommendation that House Joint Resolution 11 do pass. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion has passed, been adopted by Committee of the Whole. House Joint Resolution has passed. 11 has passed Committee of the Whole. We are now on to House Bill 197. The reading clerk will read the bill. House Bill 197, sponsored by Representative Newsom. Connect Wyoming program federal funding, an act relating to the emergency expenses of government related to broadband internet access. Mr. Speaker, your committee number two appropriations to whom was referred House Bill 197, Connect Wyoming program federal funding, Respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representatives Kenner, Larson Lloyd, Nicholas, Schwartz, Simpson, Stiff, Walters. Representative Nicholas, Chairman. You have heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure? Chairman <clears throat> Nicholas. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I move when the committee hold rise and report. It does so with a recommendation that House Bill 197 do pass, and I will turn the explanation of the bill over to the sponsor from the Northwest. Chairman Newsom. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, access to high quality business and residential broadband is essential to the development and growth of our, of our businesses and also improving academic performance, supporting healthcare, promoting innovation and entrepreneurship, attracting investment and educating the workforce of the future. Our quality of life and improving Wyoming's position as a global competitor. As we talked earlier about the um, budget bill from our colleagues down the hall, we talked about bills just like this. This bill in particular addresses broadband, the importance of broadband for our communities and getting broadband on the list of things that we want to support and that we want to fund as we go forward with the um, care, with the money left over from COVID support from the federal government as well as new funding that's coming our way. So this bill um, addresses that. I'll walk you quickly through the bill. It's just a, um, relating to broadband and the internet. And then there is appropriated uh, $40 million. And it is in support of um, having new broadband access in our communities. And there is an amendment. And I, or I can do it. Chairman Nicholas, would you like to move the amendment? Yeah, I would move standing committee amendment number one to House Bill 197 and ask for your favorable consideration. So ladies and gentlemen, and I'll explain the amendment. So this, what the, the appropriations did was we removed the funding, the funding amount, <clears throat> similar to um, other um, CARES Act related dollars, and just said that the amount will be determined by the legislature in a special session. So we're balancing out um, how much for each type of program or COVID dollars um, proposition uh, comes up. And as, as you know, there's um, in the new um, 
our um, ARF bill that just came out, the, uh, there are, um, I think, $109 million specifically directed towards capital construction. And so what we'll do is we'll balance out the dollars from the, uh, the COVID CARES Act and the new act, and then how this body and the body down the hall kind of balance out what capital construction will be funded and what broadband can be funded and how much. And so uh, I ask for your favorable consideration. Thank you. You have heard the motion on the standing committee amendment. Question having been called, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Standing committee amendment number one to House Bill 197 has been adopted. We are back on the bill. Question having been called. All those in favor of Representative Nichols' motion that when the committee of the whole rise to report, it do so with the recommendation that bill number 197 do pass. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. House Bill 197 has passed Committee of the Whole. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 142. The reading clerk will read the bill. House Bill 142, sponsored by Blockchain. Commercial Filing System Update, an act relating to corporations. Mr. Speaker, your committee number two, Appropriations, to whom is referred House Bill 142, Commercial Filing System Update, Respectful report, same back to the House, with a recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representatives Kenner, Larson Lloyd, Nicholas, Schwartz, Simpson, Stith, Walters. Representative Nicholas, Chairman. You have heard the reading of the bill. What is your pl pleasure, Chairman Thank you, Nicholas? Madam Chairman. I move when the committee whole rise and report. It does so with a recommendation that House Bill 142 do pass. And I will turn the explanation of the bill over to my colleague from this big city. Thank you. Representative hey. Olson. Do you, do you wanna move the, just move the standing committee amendment? Yeah, I, I would also move um, standing committee amendment um, number one, and I'll turn the explanation of the amendment over or I'll take it over however you wanna do it. Okay, okay. all right. Representative Thank Olson. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so, I mean, I'll probably, I'll probably get into the amendment as I, describe it because ultimately what this is, is this is a bill that came out of our select committee on blockchain. And what it deals with is an API system for um, uh, the office in our, the office that oversees uh, primarily our business filings and maintenance uh, in the state of Wyoming. And so as you may be aware, there's a quasi online filing system, primarily for new um, businesses and a little more limited on, on business maintenance. And uh, so all this bill contemplates is um, a system that goes beyond that online filing um, to what's called an API. That's an application programming interface. On page three of the bill, uh, lines 10 through 12 walks you through a definition of, of what that is. Definitionally, it's a computer software intermediary or protocol, which allows two or more distinct software applications to interact. So what does that mean? It just simply means that as opposed to in my business, um, let's say I'm a business that all day long, I register new businesses and I help maintain their businesses, um, as opposed to logging into an online portal and submitting um, data to the um, office to create or maintain that business. I may actually have my own software protocol in my, uh, in my business and with the, um, the, the government's or the agency's similar type system that at least interacts with it, I'm allowed to interact directly through that protocol. And so I don't go through the online system instead um, through an online filing, I'm using this API. And you might ask, well, what is, what is the benefit of that? Well, number one, there's, really no state that truly does this. So it's, it's trying to move Wyoming again towards a first. And in the business world, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this because in your private lives, you, um, you work in businesses, you live in business, you run business, whatever it may be, um, the speed is fast, very fast. And so in the state on the East Coast, I guess we can say in Delaware, uh, probably the closest thing to this where they have 24-7 agencies, um, registered agent services, 
that interact with their government 24 seven. We don't, we don't really, we don't have that in Wyoming. Um, but uh, the reality is, is the reason that's one of the reasons why people incorporate in Delaware is, in, is because of the apparatus that's built around in the community that allows you at 1159 um, right before the stroke of midnight to make a change to your business. Best example, stocks. How many you have a business filing and your business filing, it defines how many, what are, how many stocks you have, how they're divided out. You want to change that. You change it 1159, for example, um, using, using a protocol like this, the theory is down the line, of course, is that with a bunch of if thens built into the system, you wouldn't necessarily even need that employee sitting in your office at 1159 to make that filing. Instead, you would have already pre-programmed using smart contracts, um, a system that said, if the following conditions happen, then file this filing on behalf of this company. And so when, when your um, data is entered inside your company, 1159 trigger goes off because it, it meets all the qualifications and off goes um, the filing to the secretary. So that's, it's really a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a much different way of um, filing and maintaining your business. Not to say that our good secretary's office doesn't have um, a phenomenal and advanced system because they absolutely do. So what this bill does is say, okay, we're gonna set aside an appropriation and allow um, our good secretary's office to study uh, this concept of, of an API, providing that appropriation for developing this, new, this potential new filing system. And uh, before we take off running and actually create that new filing system, all we're doing is providing a $250,000 appropriation to conduct that study, um, report it back to the blockchain uh, committee to eat an involving ETS and now the uh, Joint Appropriations Committee and figure out whether that system is feasible and what the benefits are and the drawbacks to the state of Wyoming. So that's, that's the bill. I guess I just explained the bill in its new amended form actually. So that is the amendment. So I guess I would take any questions on the Oh, the only other part of the amendment I guess I forgot to mention is this actually involves our court systems as well. When this bill was first drafted, it involved specifically the Chancery Court and allowing for the same or similar system to be ex ex uh, implemented through the Chancery Court. However, uh, the amendment broadens that simply to allow um, the Supreme Court to explore um, developing the same system. It's not limited to the Chancery Court. And that's the amendment. So take any questions on the amendment, Madam Chair. We have heard the motion on the standing committee amendment. We're ready for the question. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Aye. The standing committee amendment has failed. We are back on the bill. Standing division. Okay. All those in favor, please stand. It's a good amendment. What is that? I think I'm going to do like this. So Thirty-three. The amendment has been adopted. Um, we are back on the bill. In question being called, all those in favor of Representative Nicholas' motion that when Committee of the Whole rise to report, it do so with the recommendation that House Bill One Hundred and Forty-Two do pass. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. House Bill One Hundred and Forty-Two has passed the Committee of the Whole. Representative Summers. Madam Chairman, thank you. And so ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna do a little reorder here. So the next bill on Committee of the Whole will be 143, but then the next bill will be 158. 
And then we'll go back into order. So then it'll be back to 170 and then 153. And then we'll have House Bill 189 will replace House Bill 187. So House Bill 158 replaces 243 and 189 replaces 187. Thank you. The next bill for our consideration is House Bill 158. The reading clerk will read the bill. Oh, I'm sorry, House Bill 143. I'm skipping around. <laughs> House Bill 143, sponsored by Block, or by Representative Blackburn. Municipal Services Recovery Actions, an act relating to municipal services. Mr. Speaker, your committee number seven, corporations, elections, and political subdivisions, to whom is referred House Bill 143, Municipal Services, Recovery Actions, respectfully report same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representatives Blackburn, Clawson, Duncan, Hunt, McGuire, Zwanitzer. Noes, Representatives Clifford, Ayer, Roscoe. Representative Zwanitzer, Chairman. You've heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure, Representative Zwanitzer? Thank you, Madam Chairman. I move when the committee of the whole rise to report to do so with the recommendation that House Bill 143 do pass. There are no standing committee amendments, and I would turn it over to the good representative from District 42. Representative Blackburn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I present you House Bill 143, I bring in House Bill 143 and ask for your favorable consideration, and I'll explain the bill at this time. The purpose of this bill is to have people that use water, sewer, and garbage in a municipality or town to pay for their usage, not someone else. Section one of the bill, we created Wyoming Statutes 157115. A, a town or city cannot collect or attempt to collect any past due bills from a property owner that is not contracted with them. B, property owner is not required to contract with a city or town when not living on the property and the tenant does. Section C, does not modify or repair, change or cancel any existing contract between an owner and a city. And section three is effective date, July the 1st, 2021. The reason this bill came about was because landlords in different municipalities and towns across the state are required in some municipalities to have to pick up the water bill for tenants that use that water, sewer, or garbage. That'd be kind of like somebody else paying for your steak at the restaurant. Uh, probably not unfair, or probably not fair, I mean. Um, so with that, I'll stand for any questions. There's no questions, I'll ask for the question. <laughs> uh, Representative Stith. Madam Chairwoman, a uh, question for the uh, bringer of the bill. So if I understand it right, this says that if I'm a landlord and my tenant skips out on the water bill, then I don't have to pay the water bill. And that's what the bill does, right? Madam Chair, exactly. Rep Representative Stith. Madam Chairman, so a follow-up question to that then is, if I understand it right, our water utilities are based upon the notion that everyone pays the same rate of water because everybody pays for the water that gets used. And so you don't have water, for example, that someone's getting for free, right? The landlord controls the relationship with the tenant. So why do we need this when the landlord could, for example, provide just as they provide for a deposit for cleaning at the end of the lease, prov provide for a utility deposit? In other words, because it seems like what this bill does is doesn't this bill just offload the amounts for the unpaid water onto all the other, all the other rate payers and lets the landlord get off for free, basically? Representative Duncan. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, this is basically what, what the, the issue is, is utilities should be a user-based fee. 
So what's happening is that the landlords are having to subsidize the uh, tenants rather than the utilities charging the, um, the user. So in these communities that are not charging a deposit or not charging a deposit sufficient enough for to collect and go after those tenants or you know anybody, what's happening is that they're turning around and they are allowing these tenants to go from property to property to property and escalate these, these bills. Whereas if the landlord were to be able to call the utility and say, hey, do you, it, it, do you have, um, does this tenant have a bill with you? Are they a, a chronic problem? The utilities, what we found in testimony is these utilities aren't even keeping track of these tenants. So we wouldn't even be putting these tenants in these properties with these chronic utility bills and who are chronically going from property to property but the utility companies aren't even keeping track of these tenants either. Whereas other, company, uh, other communities and municipalities are charging uh, deposits. And if you look at some of the other utilities like the gas companies and such, they are doing it on a user basis, not a property basis, but a user basis. So that's what's happening. It's not necessarily, the person who's using the utility should be paying for the utility. Representative Ayer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is another example of the state trying to insert itself into a local issue. There are lots of music, municipalities, probably most of them, who provide some type of utility service, such as those mentioned in this bill, sanitary sewer, water, trash and recycling, Although it's not mentioned in this bill, some municipalities also provide electric and gas utility service. None of these local entities are regulated by the Public Service Commission under the theory of home rule. That is, those who have a grievance or a dispute with their utility provider have access through their locally elected public officials. We have 99 incorporated municipalities in the state. And admittedly, we didn't hear from all of them, but we heard from quite a few, from some of them in our committee. We heard from that organization that represents our municipal systems, and they all are in opposition to this bill. If the decision by a municipal utility to put the burden of paying for the utility service on the landlord is a problem, then those adversely impacted by that decision should appeal to the local city council who are answerable to them through the ballot box. They are the ones closest to the problem. They are the ones who have, are most able to decide on a proper solution. I believe this bill is a perfect example of a local problem looking for a statewide solution. We should not be imposing our solution on the other 98 municipalities where there no such problem exists. I urge your no vote on this bill. Thank you. Representative Connolly. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have just a couple of questions for the, the bringer of the bill because I'm kind of confused. I, for the most part, it's my understanding that, that landlords charge deposits for tenants and give back those deposits once all bills are in and so that that happens and that this would be a, a good example of why a tenant would not get their deposit back. So there's that element with A, but B honestly really kind of um, following up on the last speaker really concerns me that it seems like we're now telling a city that they can't require a property owner to contract with the city for the provision of the services. Why would we do that? Uh, I'm just, I'm very confused. Thank you. Representative Banks. Madam Chairman, on and against the, the bill, um, I think this changes the way we're doing things and puts taxpayers or ratepayers paying for those bills that are unpaid between, which really should be between the landlord and his or her tenants. That's what there's deposits for. 
my city estimates if we go to this, it's gonna cost a good quarter of a million dollars for additional staff and time to track those. We have a number of apartment complexes, for instance, that have one meter for the entire complex. I know that there is some grandfather language in there, but what happens if that apartment complex is then sold to somebody else? Do each of those need to be independently metered? I think this is something the landlord should be handling between he or she and the tenant, and that's what deposits are for. We shouldn't make rate payers or taxpayers. Representative Yen. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, you know, I, I think this actually creates a real loophole. So if I'm a second homeowner uh, and I, you know, I don't, I don't consider my second home, my residence somewhere in else in Wyoming, and I just feel like I don't want to pay water. I just make uh, my cousin who lives somewhere else, uh, have him sign a tenant agreement and uh, sign up for water. And then I can stay in the house whenever I want, because I'm not the tenant. Uh, and that city can't do anything, right? If we pass this bill. Uh, so I, I, I think this is a, a little dangerous and I think I would ask you to vote no on this. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Representative Brown. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. So, you know, the talk about uh, deposits is, I, I get it, but imagine if you will, you have an apartment or a house that you rent for a thousand dollars and then you require a thousand dollar deposit. Okay, that thousand dollar deposit. And at the end of seven months into a 12 month lease, said renter walks in, you walk into said renter's house and they haven't paid rent. You're 15 days into this month and you find out that the house is abandoned. It's trashed. There's holes in the wall. There's broken windows, well over a thousand dollars worth of damage. And not only that, you go check the mailbox and there's now a $600 bill for water. And I $800 bill for electricity because it's 84 degrees set on that thermostat. I have a thousand dollar deposit. They have not returned any phone calls and I'm basically out thousands upon thousands of dollars. The last thing that I should be responsible for as a landlord is what my tenant decided to do for water and electricity usage. So I understand the, under, the, the, the concept here that we, we don't wanna, this is something that the landlord should be responsible, but there's also personal responsibility built into this. And this is saying that if you enter into a contract as a renter with any type of utility, you're responsible for those. Not me as a landlord, I'm not responsible for your bills. That's what we're saying with this bill, on and forth. Representative Gray. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Please vote aye on this bill. I, that example that was given two speakers ago, that, that, that's a classic example of fraud. So uh, I, I don't think that that would be a loophole in this bill. Uh, municipalities already have the ability to do this. It won't cost any more. It's within their program. They just, they just have it within their program so that it can be tracked. They, they should be able to do this. And at some point we have to to ask ourselves what's right. And it's not right that the landlord should be incurring these costs uh, on the back end that the tenant was supposed to pay and did not did not pay. So um, I urge and I vote on this bill. And, and one other thing I'd say is that every, every issue we deal with is a local issue. And this is another local issue because it's, it's affecting our entire state. So please vote aye on this bill. Representative Henderson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm on and for this bill, I'm signed on to it. And I just gave an example of a real world experience where, you know, with the best of intentions, you engaged in a contract called a lease with the tenant. And you do your good faith diligence, you prepare the property as the statute requires, you provide a hot water heater. And if you look much farther in statute, there's nothing in there that says that the owner of the property is required to cover the tenant's debt or whatever decisions they make on their own regarding utilities, phone, food, or whatever. Uh, so I'm, I'm just suggesting that this is not just a local issue. This isn't a local problem. We have a couple of communities in our state that have gone the extra step, which is where we have the part in this that talks about, you know, you don't want the government coming and saying, you know, you're gonna sign up for this account to, to cover the, to be on the account, to cover the cost of the utilities. 
I don't think it works that way. Now, if you want to do it on your own volition, that's, that's your business. That's your, that's your choice. That's up to you. If you want to include the utilities in your property when you set it up for a lease or rental, that's your business. That's your choice. You're a private property owner. And, you know, I think there's some of these uh, municipalities, uh, the town over the hill here, who requires uh, the tenant to sign on the same account with the, with the uh, I mean, the landlord to sign on the same account with the tenant. And, uh, you know, uh, nobody's going to twist my arm to put a signature on a line. I could tell you that, that at the end of the lease, the lease provides provisions. And uh, those provisions should be followed in terms of default or how the property is supposed to be handed, handed back to the, you know, to the, uh, to the owner. Uh, as regarding, you know, the, uh, the amounts, I mean, it, it was mentioned before that some, some tenants do this as a matter of habit. They're a serial uh, tenant. They, they go to one place and they set it up, they jack up the utilities, and then they bail and they go to the next place down the street. I think we, we have a responsibility as a legislature to look at these cities and towns across our state and make sure they're properly regulated. I mean, in terms of our legislation, right, our statutes. That is, that is in our purview. You know, it's just like the Constitution. If the Constitution isn't being observed like it should be in certain places in our state, now it may be a, a local e example of, of not being a, uh, uh, done right. But I think we have responsibility to enforce the statutes in a way that's fair and equitable to everyone involved. I don't believe that we are the, are the people or have the responsibility to be government sheriffs when we're, when we're, when we're tenants. I think we have uh, responsibility to provide the property uh, per the, the terms of the lease that we set up, right? You wanna have something, that's, something that you'd want to have if you wanted to move in and rent it. But you don't stand there and orbit over that over that tenant every day to see how much how much utilities they use, how much how often they got the lights on, that kind of stuff, or how, how they handle the trash and whatnot. But if the if the place is unkept, I think you're going to get give them a friendly reminder. So I think it's just a good neighbor policy. And you know what you don't want is you don't want to have your due process interfered with, right? So the first time that you hear about it is you get threatened with a shutoff notice because you have no idea that they've jacked up uh, the, the, the water and trash. Now the electric side of it, it's had a little bit, a little bit better in my mind because in our, in our climate, you know, you, you don't want the, you don't want the, the, uh, the electricity and, and the gas to, to go off when they move out because you don't want the pipes to freeze and cause more damage. So most often it's a matter of, of common practice that, that those lights stay on and, and you take care of it if, if it's vacant. So I think this makes a lot of sense and I'd urge your favorable support. Thank you. Representative Washett. Thank you, Madam Chair. On and for this bill, you know, one of the issues we hear a lot about is affordable housing in our communities. Well, why is housing so expensive? Sometimes it's so expensive because these landlords are having to bear all these expenses that were incurred by their tenants who then shafted them and moved away. And thus the landlord has to pass those costs onto future occupants of that property. If we wanna have affordable housing for people, we gotta hold people responsible for their own actions. And when they use the water, they ought to pay for it. I'm honored for it. Representative Yen. Thank you, Madam Chairman. So I, I remember that so to, to go back to the, the scenario brought by a couple of representatives ago about the person left the heat on really high and used a bunch of water and just abandoned the property, right? And they didn't pay rent for a couple months and so the deposit's not enough. So the question is, if a municipality doesn't have any recourse to collect from the renter, if the renter has left the state of Wyoming, right? Then they have no recourse, right? So th that they have to absorb the cost of, of whatever that municipal um, water usage or heat usage is. and, and so the question is, who's going to pay that? And the people who pay that is every other property owner with their rates going up. And so is that equitable, equitable that a property owner who should know how their property is being used, if their property is being used improperly, they need to follow up on that and deal with it. Or does, it, or does the pain fall on every other rate payer in that municipality where they have to pay the burden of the deadbeat tenant? 
Uh, so, you know, I don't think it really is the responsibility of me to pay for uh, someone who rented out to someone poor, uh, someone who, who was poor with their uh, management of the, of the property. I think the property owner needs to take responsibility for the people he, who he puts in their property on how their property is being used and then bear the responsibility if they choose to contract with someone poorly. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Representative Ayer. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I think we're complicating this issue way beyond what it should be. We all believe that the entity closest to the people is the entity that governs best. I say that all the time. The, the governmental entity that's closest to the people is the one that is best, at, be, best equipped to handle any situation. So if there's a problem with the local municipality, with their deposit policy, with their tenant agreements or whatever, the place to solve that is at the local entity, at the municipality, not at the state level. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Representative Blackburn. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> well, let me see if I can answer some of these. Uh, some other representatives did answer some of the questions for me, which I thank them. Uh, this is not about whether a landlord checks his property or not. The landlord does check his property, I'm assuming. I am a landlord. Um, I do check my property. I make sure the snow is off the sidewalk. I make sure the windows aren't broken. I make sure they pay their rent on time. I have no control over their gas, their lights, their water, their sewer, or their trash, what they use and what they don't use. I have no way of knowing. Well. I'll back up a couple. I do have a way of knowing. I, my water department in my city is very good with me. I get a bill along with my renter at the same time. So when they come behind in their water bill, I do know that. But is that my responsibility to go and collect that bill from them? I don't provide the water. I provide a house. I provide a home, everything that they need to live comfortably in that home. And my rents are inexpensive and my homes are nice. Uh, as far as local control, I think we talk about local things that could be construed as only local control almost on a daily basis in this legislature. We pass legislation that may only affect one or two places. So are we overstepping our bounds? I think not. Uh, as I think there was a question about apartment buildings with one meter. I'm not sure how that works. Uh, I don't have apartment houses, but I would assume that with one meter, the landlord probably <clears throat> pays for that water and he probably bills out equally to each apartment that's rented out. That's, that would make sense, that's how I would do it. So if there's no other questions, I ask call for the question. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I sit on this committee and her testimony and I, I voted no. And the reason why I voted no is from my experience and what I see uh, my constituents go through, uh, most have to go through credit checks that the landlord requires. Um, there's a checklist. And what I heard in testimony, you know, is some municipalities take care of it way better than others. They have a checklist, they have sideboards, um, you know, to rent to people. And I, I just think, the situation we're in now with our debt, uh, with our struggles, with our financial situation, I just don't think it's fair to put that debt onto, onto um, municipalities if it's the landlord. And so um, I'm just on and um, opposed to the bill. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Representative Prego, Prego. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. On and against the bill, and I just want everybody to understand what what's actually going to happen if we pass this bill, which is everybody's water rates will most likely go up because we will be transferring those unpaid bills from the people who have skipped out of town or are un, un, unable to pay the bills to the, the rest of the rate payers. And most towns, um, I happen to represent one sometimes, and most towns already have ordinances in place that actually, or rules or regs, one of the two, that actually deal with this issue. And most of them actually make the landowner or the, you know, the landlord part of the water agreement with the tenant so that there's an additional person on the line to pay that bill. Not because it's never a problem, but because it's a problem a lot of the time. And you end up with people who take off, don't pay their bill. And at that point, the rest of the ratepayers end up covering that cost because it's not collectible. And there's no way to really cover that cost except hopefully through a deposit with the landlord. And that's usually how it's dealt with. That's how we've dealt with it before. On and against. Thank you. Representative Haroldson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Real quick, just on uh, page two, line six, it talks about that this only applies if the property owner has not contracted with the city. So this is when an individual contracted, they're just being held to their contract. That's all this really boils down to. And with that, I call for the question. Question being called. All those in favor of Representative Zwanitzer's motion that when Committee of the Whole rises to report, it do so with the recommendation that House Bill number 143 do pass. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. no. House Bill 143 has not passed Committee of the Whole. Division being called, all those in favor, please stand. We have 20, 20 yes. Those opposed, please stand. Thirty two. So Having failed a standing division, House Bill 143 has not passed Committee of the Whole. Uh, we are moving to a roll call vote. The Chief Clerk will call the roll. Andrew. Aye. Baker. Aye. Banks. Aye. Fair. Aye. Blackburn. Aye. Brown. Aye. Burkhart. Aye. Burt. Clausen, Clifford, Connolly, Crago, Duncan, Eckland, Eckland, Air, Flitner excused, Fortner, Gray, Greer, Hallinan, Haroldson, Harshman, Heiner, Henderson, Hunt, Jennings, Jennings, Kenner, Kenner, Knapp, Larson Lloyd, Larson Dan, Larson Dan, McGuire, Martinez, Nyman, Newsom. Nicholas, Oakley, Obermuller, Obermuller, O'Hearn, no, Olson, Ottman, Paxton, Paxton, Provenza, Roscoe, Schwartz. Shorts? 
Sherwood. No. Simpson. No. Summers. No. Stith. No. Stivar. Aye. Sweeney. Aye. Walters. No. Washit. Western. No. Wharf. No. Williams. No. Wilson. No. Winter. No. Yin. No. Zawanitzer. No. Mr. Speaker. No. Eklund. No. Excused. Jennings. Excused. Kenner. Excused. Larson Dan. Excused. Obermuller. Excused. Paxton. Excused. Closing vote. Are there any changes? Closing vote. The vote is closed. 23 aye, 30 no, 7 excused. Pursuant to House Rule 66, B, House Bill 143, having failed a roll call vote, is indefinitely postponed. Yes, please, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Next bill for our consideration is House Bill 158. House Bill 158, sponsored by Representative Harshman. Local land use planning and zoning, an act relating to land use planning. Mr. Speaker, your committee number two appropriations to whom is referred House Bill 158, local land use planning and zoning, respectfully report same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Ayes. Representatives Kenner. Larson Lloyd, Nicholas, Schwartz, Simpson, Stith, Walters, Representative Nicholas, Chairman. You've heard the reading of the bill. What's your pleasure? Chairman Nicholas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move when the committee whole rise and report. It does so with a recommendation that a House Bill 158 do pass. And I will turn the explanation of the bill and the, uh, and the, and the amendment over to the good representative from Casper. <laughs> Thank you very much. Chairman Harshman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would uh, just move the standing committee amendments been moved. I just explained it's two words on page three, line 12 after the word plan as authority is inserted. Any questions? I'd call for the question standing committee amendment. Any question on the standing committee amendment? Any questions? Seeing none. All those in favor of the adoption of the standing committee amendment, please say aye. Those opposed, no. The, am the amendment is adopted. Okay, Mr. Back on the bill, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and uh, pretending we're in the budget session, two minutes to introduce the bill. I'm going to try to do this in one minute. Okay, this bill is classic private property rights. Uh, recent Wyoming Supreme Court case in this county uh, reaffirmed that zoning regulations have the force of law, not vision documents, planning documents, or other documents that would restrict a private person's uh, a person's private property rights. And so three sex, three titles are amended, Title IX, which are uh, land use planning statutes, Title 15 are local ordinances, and of course, uh, Title 18 county commissions. And the bottom line is, folks, we, we uh, require planning and, and vision documents, but those things are not the force of law. And this makes this crystal clear, and uh, I'd stand for any questions, Mr. Speaker. We're on the bill, any questions on the bill? We're on House Bill 158, seeing none. All those in favor of Chairman Nicholas's motion when the committee of the whole rise to forward to do so with the recommendation. House Bill 158 do pass, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. House Bill 158 has passed committee of the whole. Next bill for our consideration is House Bill 170. House Bill 170, sponsored by Representative Henderson. 
Wyoming Economic Development Zones, an act relating to economic development. Mr. Speaker, your committee number nine, Minerals, Business and Economic Development, to whom was referred House Bill 170, Wyoming Economic Development Zones, respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representatives Bear, Burkhart, Duncan, Air, Gray, Greer, Heiner, Sherwood. Nose, excuse me, excused, Representative Western. Representative Greer, Chairman. You've heard the reading of the bill. What's your pleasure? Chairman Greer. This is House Bill 170. Speaker, I move that with the committee, the whole rises report to do so. The recommendation of House Bill 170 do pass. Mr. Speaker, there's standing committee amendments, but I'll, I'll go ahead and move that standing committee amendment once we get an explanation of the bill. So I'll turn it over to the good gentleman from the capital city. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You move both the bill and the standing committee amendment, just to be clear. Mr. Speaker, I can move the standing committee amendment now. So I will move standing committee amendment number one. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Henderson, floor is yours for House Bill 170 and take up the standing committee at your pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With your, uh, with your permission, I'd like to go ahead and do the standing committee amendment first. Uh, folks, in brief, what this is about is providing a, a means to uh, help our communities and our areas across the state in, in, in regard to their efforts in economic development. There's a lot of activities ongoing, as you know. And so uh, the, uh, the standing committee, if you turn to that amendment, uh, if, if you go through the bill, instead of designate, the purpose of the bill is, is to enable a mechanism to help the communities in economic development, but also to help uh, support what's going on with our council that, that manages business and and other good things with regard to economic development. And so instead of designate, the, the amendment uses the word identify, identification, identity, identifying, and so forth. And then uh, line 27 of the amendment, based on input and testimony during the, uh, the presentation to the standing committee, uh, we've added the uh, uh, indicator called value added outdoor recreation. Basically what this is, is, is it has a requirement to build a policy for economic development and promote it from the ground up, from the community up, rather than from the top down. And uh, so if you continue on, you continue on with identification and then line 36, there's a report requirement for the, uh, for the council and the uh, decision was made that it'd be best to have that, that uh, date moved up a month in November rather than December. And so that's basically the standing committee and if there's no questions, I'd, I'd ask for the question. Question being called, all those in favor of standing committee amendment number one to House Bill 170, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. Standing committee amendment number one has uh, been adopted. We're on the bill. Representative Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so, as I said, we want to we want to help promote economic development. And so, what we want to do is to make sure that we're getting the right support in the right place at the right time for the communities across the state. We have an agency in the federal government that's on the East Coast that has to do with economic development, and they require an economic development strategy as a mechanism. A, 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 a prerequisite to, to have in place in order to be able to get some funding and support from the, from the federal government. Please bear in mind that, you know, uh, economic development is, is not, uh, you know, we'll talk about it today and it'll be done next week. It's about, it, it, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And so it involves a lot of planning, of course, and in our communities, some of the smaller ones, particularly, you know, 
they don't have the skill sets, they don't have the staff or the people there to take care of this sort of planning preparation. And uh, so, you know, you think about the what, the why, the how, and the when, but frankly, I think what's more important is the where. You know, we hear a lot of talk about different, different things going on about the state, and we have a lot of good activity going on with the regional areas with our regional economic development activities. And you know what's going on in your area. And so uh, I'd just like to highlight that, you know, with effective planning, we can identify the critical needs, you know, and, and uh, ex uh, which should help expose, you know, where, where, you need, where you need to develop, where your growth barriers are. In my view, uh, over the years, I've seen with good development and inclusive collaborative planning, we bring people together and resources together and we get things done pretty well in Wyoming. And if you look at this, this uh, economic development agency's map of economic development districts across the country, and you look at it and visualize, and everywhere across the country, this map is colored and covered in with economic development districts, except for Wyoming. And over our state is this big white spot. Well, why is that? Well, there's a lot of bureaucracy involved with, with the federal government, right? They, I'm, I'm from the federal government, I'm here to help. They, they have strings attached. But we have opportunities in our state that we've, that we've identified and put together in, in, in regions, like up in the Northwest with the tourism, up in the Northeast with, you know, with carbon capture, down here in our county with data centers and technology in terms of you know, cloud development and so forth. You know, just outside of town, there's a major uh, national agency uh, with the largest and fastest computer on the planet. And so I just think this is, a, this is a very good opportunity to help bring to the front of mind in the short term memory at this critical point in our state where we had a really hot, hard patch over the last several months in terms of the impact of, of you know, the, the uh, pandemic and the impact on the economy. And, the, and fundamentally, what this is, is I talked about that important coordination requirement at the local level. But I've also uh, listed in here, as you'll see, there's, there's two types of indicators. There's need indicators, you know, what's need? What's the basic things we want to look at in terms of indicators related to need in, in the various areas where we're, we're thinking about doing economic development and develop that important economic development strategy? And then there's success indicators. And I mentioned the one, the value added recreation. And so this all kind of fits together, but, but I think it's important that, that we go forward with the conversation and this will help start that. So with that, I'll stand for questions. And if there aren't any, I'll ask for the question. Uh, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I did have a question. And, and the bringer of the bill has such a wonderful, soothing voice. It's, it's very soothing. But my question is on page six. Um, and, and so obviously our agencies can plan on their own. I'm sure we're very astute at planning and organizing things. And the bringer did mention this, so I'm not saying he didn't, but paragraph E, the council shall assist and coordinate the comprehensive strategy established pursuant to 13 CFR 303.7. We know that's all, and then to apply for designation. So that's that's kind of the federal deal right there. And I, I guess, I um, so what it seems to me that this bill is doing, because we could certainly plan on our own, is setting up this eight, nine pages, eight pages, specifically so we can channel federal funds for this to help us develop under the strategy that the feds have set up. So I guess I would just like to understand a little bit better um, what kind of expectations the feds have for us to, in order to designate, um, you know, I mean, what is it they want from us to be designated this? Representative Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Thank you for the question and the kind compliment. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, the economic development strategy is like is like a recipe, if you will, and it has a list of requirements that have to be put into that. And so, 
going back to the point about we can all plan, uh, actually, in order to complete this, we need some skill sets. Uh, I, would just, I, do, I would just note that currently our good council that manages business is already identified some areas, some opportunity areas, and, and these type of uh, zones have been around since, I mean, for decades. But, uh, and, 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 and they have done some cooperative activities with the local level in order to help get things going. In our Western part of the state, we had a, a situation developed with a, with a coal mine and they were, they were helpful to get something going on over there that's currently going on. We had a, a sugar factory up the road here that, that could have used these funds for leveraging. But I would just note that there's some counties that haven't waited for the federal government, haven't waited for the legislature, and they're out there trying to get things done on their own. And I think this is an opportunity to help bring this all together. And hopefully during the interim and going forward, we'll be able to take a closer look at, at the needs in the various areas and invite input from, from the people that, you know, stakeholders in the various parts of the state in order to do the right thing in the right place at the right time. And so I hope that answers your question, but, but the, you know, it, 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 it's like your tax return, I guess. If you don't file it right, well, then you don't get your refund. And, you know, I mean, that's a little simplistic, but it's kind of like that, right? I mean, even in our, in our own state, we have rules. We have rulemaking authority that we give various agencies to work on, you know, to flesh out the details. Um, so if there are no other questions, I would call for the question. Representative Ottman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll make this quick. I just wondered, um, with the designation of a board and who would implement it, would this be implement, implemented then by the Wyoming Business Council in totality, or would it be going down to the chambers and things? Also, how big is the Wyoming Business Council and how many employees are there? And are we looking at a totally different bureau um, within that, or how would that go? Because I saw there was going to be some fiscal things, but it wasn't really spelled out yet. Thank you. Representative Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. You know, the Business Council is, is our leading economic development agency in our state. And in terms of a growing government, this isn't about that. This is about helping bring to bear bring together the various pieces that are needed to help the local communities get the, the resources, the planning stuff that they need done and get the resources, the help with resources to that community. Up in the north central part of the state, for example, I mentioned that there was this big white spot. Well, we have economic development districts in Wyoming along the eastern portion of our state, but, but zero of our economic, our economic development districts on, in that area are, 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 are receiving zero funding from the from the help of the Economic Development Agency. And so we're not gonna grow government with this, but we're gonna help clarify from the local level based on inputs and commitment participation from local leaders on what they see is needed in the various communities. And then certainly the, the council has the ability currently, in terms of the exact size, I don't have the answer. I could guess, but I'm not gonna do that. But no, no ma'am, we're not going to grow government uh, by this, but what we're going to try to do is to stimulate the conversation, as I said, in economic development, to try to move forward in a proactive and productive way for the purposes of the benefit of the people in our communities. Madam so Minority. Ask, oh, oh, another question. Madam Minority Floor Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a question for the bringer of the bill. And so I understand that the purpose of this bill is to make us honestly more competitive by establishing EDZs for, for funds or grants that are out there. So if that's the case, why the level of specificity on page four, um, Romanet five, that goes all the way over from the middle of page four, all of page five, and then to the top of page six, you've got half of the alphabet in terms of specificity, and then just a catch-all that says any other facilities or industries. So I'm curious if we really need that, and if in fact it might hurt rather than help. Thanks. Representative Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Another great question, a couple of them there. So how did this get developed? 
Well, I didn't just wake up one day and, and make all this up, right? I contacted a lot of the existing economic development agencies across our state. And what really excites me about this is these words that we have in here, these are their words. These are the words of the folks in your community, in our community, who are, are working as hard as they can to get the right things done in economic development and promote more growth in terms of uh, jobs and, and, and that sort of thing. Now, I hope that answers your question. If there's no other questions, I'd call for the question. Uh, question being called. All those in favor of Representative Greer's motion that when Committee of the Whole rises to report it, do so with a recommendation that bill number uh, 170 do pass. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Uh, how, a division being called. All those in favor of House Bill 170, please stand. Those opposed? Please stand. Uh, having failed a standing division vote at 20 to 21, a roll call vote is required. The chief clerk will call the roll. Andrew, Baker, Baker, Banks, Bear, Bear, Blackburn, Brown, Burkhart, Burt, Burt, Clausen, Clifford, Connolly, Crago, Duncan, Eckland, Air, excused, Flitner, excused, Fortner, Gray, Greer, Hallinan, Haroldson, Harshman, Heiner, Henderson, Hunt, Jennings, excused, Kenner, excused, Knapp, Larson Lloyd, Larson Dan, excused, McGuire, Martinez, Nyman, excused, Newsom, Nicholas, Oakley, Excused, Obermuller, excused, O'Hearn, Olson, Ottman, Paxton, excused, Provenza, Aye. Roscoe, Aye. Schwartz, Aye. Sherwood, Aye. excused, Simpson, Aye. Summers, Aye. Stith, Aye. Stivar, Sweeney, Aye. Walters, Aye. Washett, Aye. Western, Aye. Wharf, Aye. Williams, Aye. Wilson, Aye. Winter, Aye. Yin, no. Zawanitzer, Mr. Speaker, Aye. Bear, Aye. excused, Bert. Excused, Harshman. Excused. Closing vote, are there any changes? Clifford, no to I. Further changes? Closing vote, the vote is closed. 29 I, 18 no, 13 excused. House bill, 
House Bill 170 as passed Committee of the Whole. Majority Floor Leader Summers. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, obviously we're losing people as we go. And uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to bring up a change in order, um, and it'll actually be the same order for the next bill. And then I'm going to go pe person by person to see whether they want to keep growing or how many people are here. So, um, the next bill will be House Bill 153 in the order it was in. And then the next bill after that will be House Bill 187. Thank you, Majority Floor Leader. Uh, the next bill for our consideration is House Bill 153. The reading clerk will read the bill. House Bill 153, sponsored by Representative Stith. Review of circuit court magistrate positions, an act relating to courts. Mr. Speaker, your committee number one judiciary to whom was referred House Bill 153 review of circuit court magistrate positions, respectful report, same back to the house with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, representatives Larson, Dan, Oakley, Olson, Provenza, Rodriguez, Williams, Washit, Swanitzer, Craig, Swanitzer. Noes, representatives Craigo and Yen. Representative Olson, chairman. You have heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure, representative Olson? Chairman, but thank you. Senator Olson. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I move that when the committee of the whole rises reported, do so with the recommendation that House Bill 153 do pass. And I further move the adoption of the standing committee amendment um, number one. And I'll turn over the explanation of the standing committee amendment um, and the bill take it up at the pleasure of um, the bringer of the good bill, our, one of our newest appropriators. Representative Stith. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, so House Bill 153, uh, it's about achieving uh, efficiency. What it does, it gives the Supreme Court the authority to review uh, whether full-time magistrates are, are needed in the circuit courts. Currently, there are four full-time circuit court magistrates. This bill came to us from the circuit court judges because they believe with advances in uh, technology, uh, video conferencing and the like, right, they could achieve some efficiencies. And this is in an effort to uh, achieve uh, reductions in spending uh, as mandated by our executive branch. So right now, the circuit court uh, should a magist full, the full-time magistrate positions are a kind of one-way ratchet where they get created, but the Supreme Court itself cannot uh, eliminate them. So this doesn't eliminate the full, any full-time circuit court magistrates directly, but it gives the Supreme Court the authority to do so. So it's good, good government, uh, potentially achieving some uh, efficiencies. So I'd ask for an I vote. Did, did you move the... Oh, no, no, never mind. Did you move the committee to the whole amendment? No, I moved Oh, okay, never mind. So we're still on the standing committee amendment. My, my apologies. Um, I moved the bill. The bill has been moved, and, and, and so has the standing committee amendment. So if, if there... Oh, my apologies. My apologies. Um, so we are on the bill. Yeah, mi Mr. Chairman, I messed that up. I moved the standing committee amendment that doesn't you, exist. That, that, that is my apologies. So we're still on the bill. Um, but if, if anyone would like to speak on the bill or if the committee of the whole amendment bringer would like to discuss, please. So, Representative Clausen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to move uh, committee of the whole amendment number one to uh, House Bill 153. And all of this amendment does is uh, says that uh, after the appropriate board of county commissioners uh, by resolution concurs, it, it just adds a little bit of local control to this process. So the county commissioners are involved so, so they can come up with some other options or so, some this and that. Representative, Mr. Chairman Greer on the amendment. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I like this amendment. I, so my um, the good the good chairwoman of TRW is not here, but I speak for her county as uh, as I have a little bit of it. Hey, there being a county that doesn't have a circuit court judge, 
and a full-time magistrate is absolutely necessary. And so I just want to make sure, uh, I know the statute says with consultation with the, with the county commissioners, okay? So, so we look at the Bighorn Basin and the, in the breath that our circuit court judge has to travel, he travels every day at, at least, at a minimum, 30 miles from his home, except for the one day that he's in Moreland. Uh, it's a very busy circuit for him. And you think of the duties that these magistrates do, a lot of them can be very, uh, emergency hearings. Um, there also can also be just more routine hearings. They do serve a very good purpose and they help stretch uh, the ability or the reach of the judiciary. Um, very important. So this amendment I, um, might be a little strong, but I like, I like this concept uh, to have a protection to make sure the folks in Basin, Wyoming uh, have proper access to justice, and that isn't solely decided uh, by the good people that are located here in the capital city. Chairman Zwanitz, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm going to try to be delicate. I, I certainly do not like the amendment, but I certainly agree with everything the good Chairman of Minerals just said, but let's take a second. What is a, uh, a magistrate? And I would contend, and it's my own opinion, um, that they are basically a circuit court judge, right? They are everything that a circuit court judge does, but it's called a magistrate. Why? Well, because the legislature and the Supreme Court doesn't give these counties more circuit court judges. So they hire magistrates who have all the rights, benefits, privileges, authority that a circuit court judge has, but they don't get the circuit court judge pay or retirement benefits. So if you're a county that has a full-time magistrate, um, why would you ever, ever, ever want to get rid of it? You never would, right? No, I, mean, I just cannot imagine a scenario where the Board of County Commissioners would say, you're right, Supreme Court, we don't need our, our magistrate, just take it from us. We think the, the circuit court judge in the next county over can cover our county too. It's just not gonna happen. And I think it negates the entire point of the bill as it stands. So I would strongly encourage you to vote no if you like the bill. And I do like the bill because it's this weird inconsistency in law that the Supreme Court can bring in magistrates, but apparently no one can take them out. And I, I think it's appropriate. They probably shouldn't be taken out. They probably need to become full-time circuit court judges. We're just getting around establishing them as full-time judges. So for the bill against the amendment. Representative Stith. Mr. Chairman, yeah, on and against the Committee of the Whole Amendment for a couple of reasons. One, it most likely violates uh, the separation of powers doctrine because look at what the amendment does. The amendment says that a board of county commissioners has veto power over what the Supreme Court can do. That seems to implicate separation of powers concerns. Uh, the other structural problem with the amendment is that this full-time circuit court magistrate is paid for by the state and yet you're giving the Board of County Commissioners veto power over whether that position remains or not. That also seems to be bad public policy. So on and against. Chairman Olson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on and against the amendment. And I, I think a lot of what needs to be said has been said, but just to kind of drive it home, a couple of things. Number one, the circuit court conference testified in our committee. So the circuit court judges representation testified in favor um, of the bill. So we're talking about if a magistrate is eliminated, those are the judges that have to pick up the docket. Those are the judges that have to pick up the work. They didn't oppose this bill. Um, so I think that's, that's really important to know. Could dockets get heavy, particularly in some rural areas? Absolutely. But what this bill does is rest that decision-making authority with the Supreme Court, which as the chairman of corporations pointed out, is an anomaly in our statute why that doesn't already exist. Supreme Court controls the budget for those circuit courts, not the county commissioners. So to give county commissioners a trump card in this over a budget they don't even control is just a little strange, not, not only possibly a separation of powers issues, but it's just a little strange. If the Supreme Court has to eliminate a magistrate and it overburdens its circuit court judges, 
then those circuit court, then the circuit court conference is going to be going to that Supreme Court's budget asking for money. So it's not, I, I want to back up and kind of explain that because that's a whole, the, the Supreme Court has its own budget. It's not the state's budget, it's its own budget. It's the third branch of government. And all this bill does is align within um, the statute, the authority within that branch of government. What the current statute allows for, interestingly, is the circuit court judges themselves can remove the magistrate, but not the Supreme Court. And that's all we're doing is aligning it within that branch of government, letting them control. Supreme Court has control over its own budget. If it has to make budget reductions, that's its choice. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But I think that's the most appropriate place to rest that authority. So on and against the amendment for the bill. We are on committee of the whole amendment number one, Representative Newsom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question about why then the Board of Commissioners was ever um, listed in consultation with. What would be the purpose of consulting without getting concurrence? So I'm a little confused if the bringer of the bill could explain why the county commissioners are even referenced in this bill if, if they have no power. Thank you. We're on committee of the whole amendment number one, Representative Crago. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On in favor of the amendment. So I'm, I'm one of the counties. My home county is one of the counties that has one of these full-time magistrates. And that full-time magistrate is not a circuit court judge. They don't get paid the same. Um, and that's one of the reasons we have full-time magistrates is to save money. Uh, if we did not have that magistrate in our county, we would have to have another circuit court judge to cover all of our cases. Now, we don't have enough caseload for a full-time circuit court judge, but we have enough that the circuit court judge who covers both our county and the county to the north can't handle all those issues within our county. And just so everybody understands what a magistrate does, they, they serve as the circuit court judge when the circuit court judge can't be there. They sign warrants. In our particular county, they handle all the civil cases that come through circuit court, which is a, a quite, quite a few cases. The caseload's fairly significant. They also handle all the small claims cases and so they, they, they do a great service for our county and they also save the state money. What this amendment does is make sure that at least the local officials, the people who are in that county on a day-to-day -day basis have a say in whether or not we get rid of that judge, irregardless of what the cost is. Because sometimes the cost may override. If we're looking on a statewide budget, the Supreme Court may not actually know how, how important that judge is. And I believe the county commissioners would with, with consultation with your local lawyers, the other people who traverse the court on a day-to-day -day basis on in favor of the amendment. Thank you. Are you ready for the question on the amendment? All right. Um, all those in favor of committing the whole amendment number one, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. I'm, I'm gonna call a division on that one. So uh, all those in favor of committee of the whole amendment number one, please stand. All those opposed stand. Committee, the whole amendment number one has been adopted. We are back on the bill. All right, question being called. Uh, all those in favor of Representative Olson's motion that when committed the whole rises to report it do so with the recommendation that bill number 153 do pass. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed no. no. Having failed pursuant to rules, uh, House Rule 6-6B, the bill having failed a voice vote, a standing division vote is required. All those in favor, please stand.
All those opposed, please stand. Nineteen to twenty-four. Having failed a standing division vote, a roll call vote is required. The chief clerk will call the roll. Andrew. Aye. Baker. Aye. Banks. Aye. Bear. Aye. Excused. Blackburn. Aye. Brown. Aye. Burkhart. Aye. Burt. Excused. Clausen. Clifford. Aye. Connolly. Crago. Duncan. Eklund, Air excused, Flitner excused, Fortner, excused, Gray, Greer, Hallinan, Haroldson, Harshman, Heiner, excused, Henderson, Henderson, Hunt, Jennings excused, Kenner excused, Knapp, Larson Lloyd, Larson Dan excused, McGuire, Martinez, Nyman excused, Newsom, Nicholas, Oakley excused, Obermuller excused, O'Hearn, Olson, Ottman, Ottman, Paxton excused, Provenza, Roscoe, Schwartz, Sherwood excused, Simpson, Summers, Stiff, Stivar, Sweeney, Walters, Washit. Western, Aye. Wharf, Aye. Williams, Aye. Wilson, Aye. Winter, Aye. Yin, no. Zwanitzer, Aye. Mr. Speaker. Sure. Closing vote, are there any changes? Closing vote, vote is closed, 23 aye, 23 no, 14 excused. Ah, wow. Uh, pursuant to House Rule 6-6B, House Bill uh, 153, uh, having failed a roll call vote is indefinitely postponed. The next bill for, oh, the next bill for our consideration is House Bill 146. Um, oh, is that? Apologies. House, it's House Bill 187. Uh, House Bill 187, sponsored by Representative Hunt. Elected official residency requirement, an act relating to elected officials. Mr. Speaker, your committee number seven, corporations, elections, and political subdivisions to whom was referred House Bill 187, elected official re residency requirement, respectful report same back to the House with a recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representatives Blackburn, Clawson, Clifford, Duncan, Hunt, Roscoe, Noes. Representative Zare, McGuire, Zwanitzer. Representative Ayer, Vice Chairman. You have heard the reading of the bill. What is your pleasure? Chairman Zwanitzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move in the committee of the whole rise to report it. Do so the recommendation that House Bill 187 do pass. And I will turn it over to the good representative from District 2. Representative Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, folks, I bring you House Bill 187. This is an issue concerning the uh, residency of county elected officials. Currently, um, your county elected officials, whether it's your commissioners, your clerk, your, tre your treasurer, et cetera, um, there's no stipulation that they be a resident of the county. And so this bill aims to address that. And just, I, I know at the end of the day and so forth, so um, I won't go through the bill line by line, but the point is that when it comes to, um, in order, your coroner, your district attorney, the county assessor, the county attorney, um, and uh, county commissioners, 
your treasurer and your county sheriff and uh, a clerk of the district court that the idea of this bill would be that they would be required to be a resident of that county. And this comes out of a couple of issues that we've had back home in my home county. Um, currently, we have a county uh, attorney who is not nor has ever been um, a resident of that county. And um, I would also add that this bill addresses the issue of those who move out of the county as they are currently holding office, which is another issue that we've had um, in, in Weston County. So um, similar to how legislators uh, are handled, if you move out of your legislative district, once you claim residency in an area outside of your district, you must resign the seat. That would now apply to county officials. So that is the bill would stand for question. Thank you. Madam Chairman Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do just have one brief question and, and uh, having read through rather quickly, so it says she'll be a resident of the county in which this person serves. Do you think we need to specify, you know, in second reading or so, um, a date, you know, that the person has to be a resident at the time of filing and throughout the term or a resident starting the beginning of the term and throughout the term or just to be clear on that? Chairman Zwanit, sir. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Admittedly, I've never liked this bill when it's come up before, and I, I still don't like it now. Um, and it's just a philosophical difference that I truly believe if the voters of a county want to elect somebody um, who perhaps does not full time reside there, but uh, we have this issue, I think, then it was testified they own property there, or they were elected and they move out of the county, but they're still driving through every day. Whoever the voters want, I philosophically think they should be able to be put on the ballot and they should be able to compete. And the sen I, I know I keep going back to the census figures, but we have four counties losing population. And I'm not trying to pick on those four counties, but at some point people may say, which has happened in a certain county, um, I think twice now the two issues related to this bill happen to be from the county that uh, the, the good bringers from, if the best qualified person lives in the county over and they're there every day and they want to do the job and the voters in that district elect them, I, I don't see what the issue is. Um, I think that's better to have, you know, whatever the position is, if it's someone the voters feel is a competent, qualified candidate, even if they live in another county and they're willing to make the, the effort to be the sheriff of that county or the county attorney or the coroner, I think that's best left up to the voters and it doesn't require their residency. And it's it's a philosophical battle we've had here before, and um, I would just encourage you to vote no for the, the bill. I think it's, it's an issue in only one or two of the counties right now. It's a, it's a very big local control fight in those counties over uh, two things which have been uh, contentious in that county, but I don't think that necessarily means it should spill on to the entire legislature at this point. Representative Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Folks, our county coroners make critical decisions about the cause and manner of death. And if, if your family member um, dies under unusual circumstances, it's going to be your county coroner who makes a determination if that was suicide, accident, murder, right? And so having qualified people in those offices, I think is vitally important. And, and to artificially restrict the county's ability to get a quality person in that role, to me, seems like bad policy. Now, it doesn't, this bill's not going to affect my county. We, we've got plenty of qualified people who can fill the role of coroner in our, our county, but I don't think that's the case with some of our smaller jurisdictions. So um, think twice about who you want making those critical determinations as your coroner. Representative Newsom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I got an email from my county commissioner today, one of my county commissioners, and they wondered about um, if you can't find somebody, specifically attorneys, to fill that role of district attorney or county attorney. And then where is your county left? There are some counties that simply do not have people that are willing to serve in these positions, particularly attorneys. Chairman Zwanitzer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman. Just to answer that, county attorney is the one position 
um, and the bill mentioned that does have a provision elsewhere in statute that a county can contract or can go outside um, to another county attorney to you know, utilize their services in both counties. Um, I don't believe there's any other provision for your county clerk or sheriff, et cetera, to have a similar contractual arrangement allowed in statute at this time. Representative Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I should have explained that, yes, and, and uh, the good chairman of corporations kind of did. But when it does come to the county attorney, <clears throat> currently in statute too, if two counties are having such an issue with finding a, someone to be in the county attorney that they, they can't in one or the other, it currently says in statute that they have the right to form a district between those two or more contiguous counties. So that goes some part of the way to addressing that issue. Um, and so, I, you know, and I, I recognize that that's probably the one position above all others where it, it obviously requires education to hold that office. Um, and, and frankly, there's not a lot of attorneys in these very small communities in these very low population counties, but there are ways to address this right now if, those, if, if two contiguous counties think that that's necessary, two or more. Um, and, um, I, you know, you've probably been hearing from the uh, Association of Counties and, and you may have seen an email here the other day um, from a county commissioner um, saying that, you know, putting out the example of, of uh, you know, rural areas, if you, uh, you, you live just over the county line, right, into the next county, but your kids go to school in the other county, they pay, you, you, you do your business in the other county, you do all these things, and you are effectively more a member of that community than you are uh, of the community in the county in which you reside. And yes, I would admit, I think that that is a fair point. But that being said, what, what, I, I think that that uh, the what you need to be remembered here is that if this stays as is, that that is no different whether you live a mile over the county line or whether you're running for office on the other side of the state. So, I mean, the way this is currently written, it's not just about two contiguous counties and whether you live 100 yards one way or the other. It's the fact that I can put my name on the ballot to run for county commissioner in Uinta County when I'm literally at Kitty Corner opposite ends of the state from it. So I, I think that there's a bona fide issue that needs to be addressed here. When it comes to, again, when it comes to the county attorney's position, there are ways that smaller counties can address that if they feel the need, if they see fit. Um, and as far as the coroner, as far as the sheriff, there's training provided for those positions. If you're elected, you can go, you, well, you basically need to go to the law enforcement academy in the center of the state um, in Converse County and receive the proper training for that office. Um, and many individuals do that. So I, I think that this is, this, it, 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 we're talking about county officials here, but I think it lends to a broader problem um, when we're talking about um, that issue in that was ex exhibited in the bill that was brought up the other day when we're talking about the residency of people running for Congress in this state. It's basically the same principle applies. So anyway, I don't wanna belabor this. It's late Friday night, um, but please vote aye. Are you ready for the question? Question being called, all those in favor of Representative Zwanitzer's motion that when the Committee of the Whole rises to report it, do so with the recommendation that bill Number 187, do pass. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. I, the chair is in doubt. Um, all those in favor, please stand. We are voting, so those having a discussion in the middle of the room, if you are voting, uh, make sure you know how. All those opposed, please stand. Twenty-four to twenty-one, so it was close. Uh, but 
House Bill 187 has passed committee of the whole. Majority floor leader, Summers. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee of the whole rise and report. You heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Stand at ease. We're still standing at ease. Thank you, committee. I, I was incorrect, the motion didn't carry, the motion failed. Um, and I will give the seat to the speaker. The motion to rise and report did carry. So members, um, there's gonna be a little bit different process now because we had at least, we had a couple of bills that were not, um, did not pass committee of the whole. I just wanna explain this and then we're, we'll go into it. So any member that wants to object to a bill that failed committee of the whole, first of all, reconsideration is not an option in um, committee of the whole. I, I haven't gone into uh, Mason's deep enough to know about rescission yet but we have no precedent for it. So we'd have to go to the rules, but there is a way to divide the committee of the whole report to object to the committee of the whole report for one or two or three bills um, and, and vote on those separately. And if you, did, if you reject the committee of the whole report on that bill, then that bill remains on committee of the whole to be potentially considered another day. So we're rejecting the committee of the whole report subject to one bill, two bills, or the entire committee of the whole report. So at this time, I guess I'm gonna ask, what? So if there's a member that wants to divide the committee of the whole report subject to one bill, I'd like them to come up to this front mic um, and anybody that has lost a bill, the, the prime sponsor can come forward to do this. And there's a motion that you'll make um, regarding this. And um, yes, no, we'll just share it. So I'm gonna recognize um, Representative Stiff and he's, here you go, Representative Stiff. 
Please use that mic. Representative Stiff. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to the House Rule 11 5 and Mason Sections 313, 671, 670, 6, and 689 6, I move to divide the Committee of the Whole Report to have a separate vote taken on that portion of the report relating to House Bill 153 Watchers. and ask that the body vote no on that portion of the report. So there's amendment to the motion to add another bill. Representative Blackburn, what's your bill that you would like added to the motion? What's your bill number, Representative Blackburn, you'd like added to the amended the motion? Mr. Speaker, pursuant to House uh, Rule 11. Representative Blackburn, I think if you just ask to amend the motion to add House Bill 143 to the motion, that's adequate. I move to, oh, where, where is it? I move to amend the motion to add House Bill 143. All right, members, and it was easier, we had a one motion on the floor, we couldn't have two at the same time. So that's why I asked him to amend the motion. So now, Representative Blackburn, I need the script back, please. All right, that motion is in order. We will be voting first on that portion of the committee whole report relating to House Bill 153 and 143. As previously, previously stated, House Bill 153 and 143 failed to pass a roll call vote in committee of the whole, and the report recommends that the bill be indefinitely proposed. The question is, should the recommendation of the committee of the whole report Committee of the Whole on House Bill 153 and 143 be adopted. If you vote aye, you are voting to adopt the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole that they should be indefinitely postponed. If you vote no, you're voting to reject the Committee of the Whole report on these two bills, and they will again be placed on general file further, pending further action of the House. The motion to adopt this portion of the Committee of the Whole report requires a majority of vote of those present and voting, not of the body of the elected. Chief Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Speaker. So uh, reading clerk, would you read the, re, uh, the Committee of the Whole report on House Bill 153 and 143 only? Mr. Speaker, your committee of the whole having had under consideration bills on general file begs leave to report as follows. House Bill 153 failed to, mass, failed to pass committee of the whole and was indefinitely postponed. House Bill 143 failed to pass committee of the whole and was indefinitely postponed. Representative Yin, Chairman. Thank you. So members, we're gonna do a roll call vote on the motion to consider these differently and deny the, uh, the uh, Committee of the Whole report. If you vote aye, you are adopting the Committee of the Whole report and the bills are indefinitely postponed. If you vote aye, those bills remain unavailable to the body. If you vote no, the bills will be available again on general file. Aye is the bills are indefinitely postponed. No is they are available. Is everybody clear? So we're voting on the motion. We're voting them separately. Usually if you vote aye, you're adopting the committee of the whole report. If you vote aye this time, these bills will not be heard again if there's a majority of the vote present. Chief Clerk, please call the roll. Andrew. No. Baker. Aye. Banks. Aye. Bear excused. Blackburn. Aye. Brown. Burkhart, Bert, excuse, oh, Bert. Clausen, 
Clifford, Connolly, Crago, Duncan, Eckland, Air excused, Flitner excused, Portner excused, Gray, Greer excused, Hallinan, Harsh, uh, Haroldson, Harshman, excused, Heiner, excused, Henderson, Hunt, Jenning, excused, Kinner, excused, Knapp, Larson Lloyd, Larson Dan, excused, McGuire, excused, Martinez, Nyman, excused, Newsom, Nicholas, Oakley, excused, Obermuller, excused, O'Hearn, no. Olson, no. Ottman, Paxton, excused, Provenza, no. Roscoe, no. Schwartz, no. Sherwood, excused, Simpson, no. Summers, no. Stith, no. Stybar, no. Sweeney, no. Walters, no. Washit, no. Western, Wharf, Williams, Wilson, Winter, Yin, Zawanitzer, Mr. Speaker. Closing vote, are there any changes? Sweeney, aye to no. Further changes? Closing vote, the vote is closed. 21 aye, 23 no, 16 excused. By your vote, you have not adopted the recommendation of the Committee of the Whole Report on House Bill 153 and House Bill 143. We'll now reconsider the rest of the Committee of the Whole Report. Reading Clerk, please read the Committee of the Remaining Committee of the Whole Report. Mr. Speaker, your Committee of the Whole, having had under consideration bills on general file, beg leaves to report as follows. House Bill 92, do pass amended. House Bill 205, do pass amended. House Bill 249, do pass amended. Correction, do pass. House Joint 9, do pass amended. House Joint 11, do pass. House Bill 197, do pass amended. House Bill 142, do pass amended. House Bill 158, do pass amended. House Bill 170, do pass amended. House Bill 187, do pass. Representative Sherwood, and Representative Yin, Chairman. I move the adoption of the Committee of the Whole Report. You've heard the adoption of the Committee of the Whole Report, number, version second part. All those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, no. We're not doing it again. Congratulations. And uh, <laughs> Representative Yin. Privilege of the floor, Representative Hunt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Privilege. Please thank, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, sorry, folks. Anyway, just up in the gallery, been watching us most of the afternoon. Just want to introduce to you all the ch now chairman of our county commission, my good friend, Marty Oatman. Um, have known him my whole life. And so uh, you've seen her down here before, but here she is again. So welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome, Commissioner Ertman. Nice to see you. Glad you're here with us. We have uh, some standing committee reports. And members, just so you know, um, we congratulate, please, uh, Representative Sherwood um, next week. Uh, Representative Yen took over for her. She uh, wasn't feeling well and, and had to excuse herself. So. Our good thoughts to her, and please uh, give her a pat on the back next week for her good work earlier today. Please. Hey. 
Standing committee reports. Mr. Speaker, your committee number one judiciary to whom was referred House Bill 210, minor sex traffic victims liability, respectfully reports same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representatives Crago, Larson Dam, Olson, Rodriguez Williams, Zawanitzer, Nose, Representatives Oakley, Provenza, Washit, and Yin. Representative Olson, Chairman. Mr. Speaker, your committee number one judiciary to whom was referred Senate file 101 engrossed pen registers and trap and trace devices authorization. Respectful report same back to the house with a recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, representatives Crago, Oakley, Olson, Rodriguez Williams, Washit, Yen, Zwanitzer. Noes, representatives Larson Dan and Provenza. Representative Olson, chairman. Mr. Speaker, your committee number one judiciary who to, was referred Senate file 124, defending Wyoming business trade and commerce amendments. Respectful report, same back to the house with a recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, representatives Crago, Larson Dan, Oakley, Olson, Provenza, Washit, Yen, Zwanitzer. Excused, representative Rodriguez Williams. Representative Olson, chairman. Mr. Speaker, your committee number two appropriations to whom was referred House Bill 51, meat processing programs. Respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representatives Kenner, Larson Lloyd, Nicholas, Schwartz, Stiff, Walters. Excused, Representative Simpson. Representative Larson, Vice Chairman. Mr. Speaker, your committee number two appropriations to whom was referred House Bill 82, Implementation requirements for medical marijuana. Respectful report, same back to the House with a recommendation that do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representatives Larson Lloyd, Nicholas, Schwartz, Stiff, Walters. Noes, Representative Kenner. Excuse, Representative Simpson. Representative Larson, Vice Chairman. Mr. Speaker, your committee number two appropriations to whom was referred House Bill 263 state coronavirus recovery funding. Respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representative Skinner, Larson Lloyd, Nicholas, Schwartz, Simpson, Stiff, Walters. Representative Nicholas, Chairman. Mr. Speaker, your committee number two appropriations to whom was referred Senate file 35, state budget department. Respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representatives Kenner, Larson Lloyd, Nicholas, Schwartz, Simpson, Stiff, Walters. Representative Nicholas, Chairman. Mr. Speaker, your committee number two appropriations to whom was referred Senate File 72, Financial Council and Reporting Budget Reductions. Respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representatives Kenner, Larson Lloyd, Nicholas, Schwartz, Simpson, Stiff, Walters. Representative Nicholas, Chairman. Mr. Speaker, your committee number two appropriations to whom was referred Senate file 119, investment of state permanent funds. Respectful report, same back to the house with the recommendation that it do pass. Ayes, Representative Skinner, Larson Lloyd, Nicholas, Schwartz, Simpson, Stiff, Walters. Representative Nicholas, Chairman. Mr. Speaker, your committee number three revenue to whom was referred House Bill 162, Medical Treatment Opportunity Act. Respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representatives Harshman, Henderson, Roscoe, Sweeney, Yin. Noes, Representatives Baker, Gray, Hallinan. Excused, Representatives Jenny. Representative Harshman, Chairman. Quite a bit of noise, members, please. Mr. Speaker, your committee number three revenue to whom was referred House Bill 189, mine product taxes for natural gas consumed on site. Respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representatives Hallinan, Harshman, Henderson, Roscoe, Yin. Noes, Representatives Baker, Gray. 
Excuse, Representative Jennings. Conflict, Representative Sweeney. Representative Harshman, Chairman. Mr. Speaker, your committee number four education to whom was referred House Bill 175, Suicide Prevention 2, respectfully reports same back to the House with the recommendation that do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representatives Andrew, Connolly, Harshman, Nyman, Newsom, Obermuller, Paxton, Summers. Noes, Representative Brown. Representative Paxton, Chairman. Mr. Speaker, your committee number nine minerals, business and economic development to whom was referred House Bill 155, electric generation reliability and liability, respectful report same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representatives Baer, Burkhart, Duncan, Ayer, Gray, Greer, Heiner, Western. Noes, Representative Sherwood. Representative Greer, Chairman. Mr. Speaker, your committee number 10, Labor, Health and Social Services, to whom was referred House Bill 70, Abortion Informed Consent. Respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representatives Fletner, Hallinan, Ottman, Romero Martinez, Stivar, Wharf, Wilson. Noes, Representatives Clifford and Connolly. Representative Wilson, Chairman. Mr. Speaker, your committee number 10, Labor, Health and Social Services, to whom was referred Senate File 52, Insurance, Mental Health and Substance Use Parity, respectful report, same back to the House with the recommendation that it do pass with the following amendments. Ayes, Representatives Clifford, Connolly, Hallinan, Ottman, Romero Martinez, Stivar, Wilson, Noes, Representatives Flitner and more. Representative Wilson, Chairman. Messages from the Senate. Message number 248. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading by the vote indicated. Senate file 49, deferral of criminal sentencing amendments. Ayes 25, noes 4, excused 1. Sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. Message 249. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading in an amended form by the vote indicated. Senate file 66, Slayer rule applied to joint ownership. Ayes 28, noes 1, excused 1. Sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. Message 250, Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading in an amended form by the vote indicated. Senate file 68, absenteeism in public schools. Ayes 29, excused 1. Sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. Message number 251. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below failed to pass the Senate's third reading by the vote indicated. Senate file 90, hemp productions and requirements. Ayes 9, noes 20, excused 1. Sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. Message 252. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading by the vote indicated. Senate file 111, School of Energy Resources Budget Submittal. Ayes 26, noes 3, excused 1. Ellen, sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. Message 253. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading in an amended form by the vote indicated. Senate file 133, prohibiting abortion effects and chemical abortions. Ayes 22, noes 7, excused 1. Sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. Message 254. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading in an amended form by the vote indicated. Senate file 136, required public service commission considerations. Ayes 25, noes 4, excused 1. Sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. Message 255. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading in an amended form by the vote indicated. Senate file 152, connection of utility services. Ayes 27, noes 2, excused 1. Sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. Message 256. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading in an amended form by the vote indicated. Senate File 67, repeal gun free zones and preemption amendments. Ayes 25, noes 4, excused 1. Sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. Message 257. 
Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passes Senate on third reading in an amended form by the vote indicated. Senate file 73, trolling authority for I-80. Tolling authority for I-80. I-16, nose 13, excused one. Sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. Message 258. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below failed to pass the Senate on third reading by the vote indicated. Senate file 92, public hospitals out of county operations. Eyes 12, no 17, excused one. Sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. Message 259. Mr. Speaker, the bill listed below passed the Senate on third reading by the vote indicated. Senate Joint Resolution 4, School Capital Construction Constitutional Amendment. Eyes 22, no 7, excused 1. Sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. Message 262. Joint confer conferees appointed. Mr. Speaker, the Senate appointed state conferees to meet with the like committee number one from the House on Amendments to House Bill 1. The Senate conferees are Senator Perkins, Chairman, Senator Guru, Senator Hicks, Senator Kinski, Senator Steinmetz. Sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. Message 14. Mr. Speaker, the Senate has completed consideration of the budget bill, House Bill 1. In accordance with JR 14 slash 1, subsection G, the bill has been referred directly to the conference committee of five members to meet with like committee from the House to report recommended amendments for final consideration by both houses with respect to both budget bills, Senate File 1 and House Bill 1, and the amendments thereto. Sincerely, Ellen Thompson, Senate Chief Clerk. Yeah, that uh, that was quite a, a trolling toll. <laughs> trolling toll. Thank you, Chief Reader. Mr. Majority Floor Leader, that is about what we can take for the day. That clears the desk. Mr. Speaker, thank you. I'll do the motion, and then after that, I will give the committee of the whole list for the last day of committee of the whole. So the motion, Mr. Speaker, I move that the House adjourn until 10 a.m. Monday, the 22nd day of March 2021. Committee announcements. Vice Chairman Dunk. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your uh, committee number nine, Minerals, will meet Monday morning at 8 a.m. And we will hear Senate File 40, Senate File 148, and Senate File 116. Vice Chairman Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your committee number four, Education, will meet Monday upon noon recess to hear the following bills. Senate File 79, Medical Billing for School-Based Services. Senate File 108, Career and Technical Education Terminology. And Senate File 115, Education Pupil Teacher Contract Time, if time allows. Chairman Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your committee number 10, Labor, Health, and Social Services, will meet Monday morning at 8 a.m. to consider three bills, we hope. Senate File 109, Board of Dental Examiners Amendments. Senate File 117, Speech and Hearing Specialist Licensing Amendments. And Senate File 47, Clinical Laboratory Regulation Day. So you see it as Licensing Day on Monday. Thank you. Chairman Olson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your committee number one judiciary will meet Monday, 8 a.m. to consider Senate File 87, Voyeurism Amendments. And Senate File 155, Limiting Firearm Seizure and Regulation During Emergencies in E001. Vice Chairman Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your favorite committee number two appropriations will be heard on Monday at noon in the Magical Room 301 to hear Senate File 2 and Senate File 6 and invite everybody to come. Was that our flavored committee? Flavored? I thought that's me. Any other, any other announcements? Any other announcements? Chairman Zwanitzer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your committee number seven, corporations will meet on noon recess on Monday in EO5 to hear Senate file 36, for-profit public benefit corporations, and Senate file 62, repealing sunset date for the Office of Consumer Advocate. Further announcements, further announcements. Mr. Majority Floor Leader. Mr. Speaker, thank you. So Monday, Committee of the whole list, and this will get posted. And if I've messed any bill up, the chief clerk will tell me the, that I have a bad number. So House Bill 146, House Bill 127, House Bill 36, House Bill 253, 
House Bill 159, House Bill 244, House Bill 219, House Bill 263, House Bill 253, House Bill 167, House Bill 176, House Bill 247, House Bill 210, House Bill 162, House Bill 254, House Bill 231, House Bill 239, and House Bill 155. My guess is no way we get through that many. Any other announcements? Any other announcements? You've heard the majority floor leader's motion that when that the Wyoming House of Representatives adjourn until the Monday, March 22nd at 10 a.m., which will be our 23rd day of the session. All those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, no. We are adjourned. Well done, Set, travel safe, and uh, look forward to seeing you on Monday.